We've now talked about uh, what it means to have an objective for explicit instruction. Now let's talk about the modeling part, the very first part of explicit instruction. The goal of this part of the module is, one, to talk about the characteristics of a queer explanation. Two, then to talk about how to design planned examples that go with the explanation. And three, how to look at instructional models and decide how effective they are. So let's start, though, by talking about how modeling fits into the database individualization framework. So we know here that we have intervention adaptation. The adaptations occur when we find that a student or students are not responding to the instruction we're providing, as shown by progress monitoring data. And we look at diagnostic assessment, and we say, something isn't working here. And if we notice that the kinds of mistakes students are making suggest maybe it's an instructional problem, our adaptation then is to increase our use of explicit instruction. And as we know, we're focusing on secondary prevention programs. But it's absolutely the case that even when you do that, it's often going to occur that the program itself is not giving you enough support in terms of doing good models. So you still need to consider modeling because, one, they may not explicitly suggest it and they may not build it in very clearly, in which case you'll need to do it. And two, they may, may not provide you with a clear explanation of the content. They may sort of give you some, some language, but not some exact wording to help you do that. And you're going to have to design that. In the case that uh, they include some models, they might not include actually enough models, leaving you to sort of figure out the rest for yourself, because you need often multiple models, particularly if the skill is complex. And so you'll need to create some more of those models. So even if you have a secondary prevention program, this is going to be really important to do. So with that, let's now talk about modeling. I'm going to start, actually, though, with an alternative. This is not going to be a model. In this case, I'm going to ask you what GLAP means. GLAP is a word. Well, it's a made up word that, that uh, we're going to use for this illustration. So take a look at these uh, slides. I'm going to describe to you whether or not these things are GLAP. So that is GLAP. That is GLAP. That is not GLAP. That is GLAP. That is not GLAP. That is GLAP. That is not GLAP. That is not GLAP. That is GLAP. That is GLAP. That is not GLAP. That is GLAP. That is GLAP. Nope. Those are, sorry. Those are not GLAP, not GLAP. Um, and not GLAP, and what does GLAP mean? Sorry about the little mistake there in the middle. But let's now talk about that. What does GLAP mean? And I can imagine any number of things you could have imagined GLAP meant based on the kinds of images I showed you. And you can see there's a wide range of these images. And so you could have thought of any of these possibilities as the, reason, as the, the sort of the characteristics of GLAP that I was paying attention to. Some of you probably figured out that actually the idea here was simply that the objects form non-parallel lines. If they form parallel lines, then it was not GLAP. Um, and some of you probably figured that out. And others of you may not have figured that out. So now I want you to do an activity where I'd like you to stop and jot in your work, but I want you to write about uh, the objective that I had and whether or not you mastered it. Did you get what I intended you get, which was the definition of GLAP? But not only that, I want you all to reflect on the experience as a learner. What was your cognitive and effective experience? How did it feel to do this is the effective part. And what were you thinking as you did it? That's the cognitive part. So go ahead in your workbook and write your thoughts about that. I'll stay here. You should pause the video. And we'll come back together when you're finished. So good luck thinking this through. Okay. So I'm presuming now that you have actually done the activity in your workbook. I'm going to tell you what I think, some of, the, some of the thoughts I had about this. So first, let's talk about whether or not you mastered the objective. So for those of you who did, and you can raise your hand or not if you're sitting at home by yourself, you think that's weird. Um, and probably even if you're in public, you don't want to do it either since you'll be looking at a computer screen. But that aside, uh, if you did master the objective, why was it you actually mastered it? Here are some thoughts I've had about why you might have mastered it. Some folks have very good working memory, and there are lots of examples, and you were able to hold on to all of those examples. And some of you are really quick thinkers where you could form a hypothesis about what GLAT meant and then test it as you went through. I think it might mean uh, you know, colored background. Nope, that didn't work because the next one doesn't have that. And so you could test out those uh, on a, uh, as I went. And if you're good at pattern recognition, you may have seen as I went through, it became clearer and clearer what GLAP meant. So that might be a reason you're able to do it. Um, my question then is, um, what was your cognitive and effective uh, experience? 
for some of you, this probably was not a lot of fun, and you found it overwhelming. And so my question for you is, why was it overwhelming? And for this, I think we can think back to the stones in the bowl. And we talked there about the importance of cognitive load, right? And so if you have difficulty processing lots of information at once, and you as a learner might be good in a general way at processing information, but I present a lot of information very quickly. And if you get all that information really quickly, then the cognitive load gets so heavy that you can't actually manage it. And so I didn't allow you to see that entire set as a way to put some stress on your working memory. You couldn't compare things in a sort of normal way. Uh, sorry for that. I did it to really help you think about um, how this could be cognitively overwhelming. And I wondered about the affective part, the emotional part. Was it frustrating and caused disengagement? I feel like many of you who probably felt upset felt like it was too difficult. And you felt like, anyway, like this is a made-up example, and I don't get it, and it's not that beneficial to me. Fortunately, it was short. That was the one saving grace of it. Um, but it probably didn't feel so great for some of you. You sort of you know, rolled your eyes at like, I don't get it. Let's move on, which we did. Here we are. Um, but I can see how it could have been frustrating. For those of you who actually enjoyed it, some of you are really enjoy, enjoy the mental gymnastics of figuring out complex puzzles and putting your working memory to the test. But this is a good example of what can happen to students when we use the kind of approach that I use there, which is really an inductive approach. So I describe it as a sorting method, but really it's a kind of inductive learning in which I ask you to figure out, to extract the information from a set that I've given you to start. And so in that approach, it's very popular to use that kind of inductive learning method. And there is some appeal to it. And there is some logic to using it. Inductive learning, particularly of this kind, requires you to think in terms of higher order thinking. By higher order thinking, I mean of more uh, complex thinking that requires you to put together multiple kinds of ideas. If you're familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, these are the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, things that require analyzing and evaluating and synthesizing information. And this is an important goal. And so people think, oh, we need to get to the higher order thinking. And so if I use this approach, it will get us to the higher order thinking. The other appeal is that the idea is that if I give you the opportunity to think this through yourself, then you're going to be the you're going to think to yourself uh, as a learner. Oh, right, I've got it now. I put this in my brain along with all the other things I know, and now I have a clearer picture than I would have had if I hadn't done it myself. In other words, I'm going to understand as a learner the information better because I was able to build my understanding of it myself. And so those are good reasons to think about using that kind of inductive approach. But modeling has a place too. Sometimes in addition to that, sometimes instead of that. The main benefit of modeling is to reduce the cognitive load so students are ready to handle these higher order thinking tasks. It can also help with efficiency. Sometimes an inductive learning task can take a long time and it might be hard actually to extract the right information. Modeling helps us get us there more quickly sometimes. It's also the case that modeling can lead to an understanding of it at a deep level, an understanding that fits a student's own understanding, fits into what they already know, and it can lead to higher order thinking, even though often it will start uh, without sort of the highest order of thinking. But that's okay. The goal is not to get to the Bloom's taxonomy as fast as possible. The goal is to create experiences that uh, result in success that then cause the student to move on and be successful. And so this is what the explicit instruction framework is all about, is giving us this way to make this happen for students. So again, to look at the explicit instruction framework, here's how it works, and I'm going to talk about where we are. So we have the modeling component of the explicit instruction framework that involves a clear explanation and planned examples. That's what we're focusing on today. Then we're going to go on in the next part of module five to talking about the practice, which is the sort of different ways we're going to, you know, practice the information that we've been modeling uh, in a lesson. And then the next modules will go over supporting practices. And so we're going to start here with the model. Um, and we're going to talk about how do we construct a good model so that it leads to really good representations of ideas in a way that the cognitive load is not high. And the rest of these things are going to help us too, but this is a key part of getting started. To help you understand a little bit about uh, the aspects of modeling, even before we talk about them as a whole, 
What I want you to do is look at the same article we talked about, we read before uh, by Martin, um, and to look at the way that Martin describes the cognitive load instruction and how that maps onto the explicit instruction framework. So Martin talks about these instructional elements. I want you to think about how do you put Martin's instructional elements into the modeling practices, supporting practices buckets, particularly thinking about what goes into that modeling piece, because that's what we're going to focus on. And hopefully, you can see the links between what I described already and what Martin uh, described in the paper. So good luck putting all that together. I hope that this helps you start to get a picture of what we're going for here, where we're headed with understanding modeling. So go ahead and do that reading. It may take you some time. You can pause the video, or you might just want to stop it, turn it off, mark your place. Um, and when you're done, you can come on back, and we'll continue on. So enjoy that reading. You've read the Martin article now and have thought a lot now about how some of the different things that he wrote about fit into our description of modeling. So now let's just kind of summarize all this piece about modeling so that we can uh, use this as a base to go forward. The main thing I want to highlight here is based on what we've already said is that modeling has the advantage of reducing the cognitive load by not requiring students to hold on to too much information at once. Because it's focused uh, in a very specific way, it can make it easy to meet objectives uh, and for students to accomplish the learning outcome and to do that really efficiently. I also want to add that um, learning theories show that it's really valuable to uh, engage in modeling. Um, learning from experts promotes skill development, and scaffolded learning promotes academic success. And so those points are really important that it's not just me who thinks this or a couple books. Learning theories promote this. And as you saw in the last part of the module, there's actually data, there are, re there are research data to support that this actually does work. It also importantly provides a foundation to promote generalization. One point made by Martin in other parts of this article uh, is that one thing that we need to make sure we do when we model and provide support is ultimately a move to generalization. That's also part of the explicit uh, the taxonomy of adaptations and really important to think about. And finally, modeling promotes engagement by reducing the cognitive load, as we've already said, um, and ensuring constant success during learning. But this relates to the engagement piece, which I haven't said already. So this is really important. We talk a lot about engagement and instruction, and modeling helps promote engagement. So that's the reason modeling is important. Now let's take a look at how we're going to talk about modeling in this module. These are the different parts of modeling. As I've talked about before, checklists are really valuable and important to help you get a picture of what good instruction is going to look like. By using a checklist, we don't have to say what we think uh, your lesson is like, like, I like that lesson. We can talk about whether or not a lesson you design meets these criteria. And today, as you watch these videos, you're going to get to see how we do that exact same thing ourselves. So this is our checklist that we're going to work through uh, as we go. And I'll talk about each part of it so we can get a sense of what each of these things means and to decide when uh, lessons meet them and when they don't. So throughout this model module, you're going to talk about, we're going to have some brief examples uh, from videos. And we're going to have some knowledge building activities there. There's going to be a variety of knowledge building activities uh, for you to do in your workbook. That's the pencil there. There'll be some discussions on checklists and a way to help others using uh, explicit instruction. Uh, that's a real thing you're going to get to do. I'm excited about that one. You've already read the Martin article. We're going to have a lead teacher demonstration to show different ways of modeling. I'm going to have this let me start it activity where I'm going to start you off and then your job will be to finish uh, that work. We have some real curriculum examples, examples that we talked about before, a good way to sort of help you think about in a secondary prevention program how you might need to make adjustments. Then the final pieces here are the ones where we get to be active in the classroom. You're going to construct a model in your journal. Uh, in your, it's going to be a journal entry within the workbook, but this will be something you'll do outside of watching the videos. And you're going to construct a model based on that checklist. And then you're going to try it out. And this is just an informal tryout. Um, this is not a big deal lesson. We only want you to do something that's five to 10 minutes. This is going to give you an opportunity to apply the things we're talking about here. So just as I just said, this is what we're going to do in the journal. You're going to prepare a model, and then you're going to try out the model uh, for yourself as well. So it's an awesome opportunity for you to actually do the stuff we're going to talk about in the rest of the module. So you probably want to learn it so you can get to it. OK, let's talk about it. So the first part is giving clear explanations. The first part of giving clear explanations is to match the explanation to the learning outcome. 
What's important here is that the way we explain something depends on the kind of knowledge students are acquiring. There are two kinds of things that we think about in terms of knowledge. One would be procedural knowledge. So for example, if you're teaching a multi-step process, there are examples here, subtraction with regrouping, identifying the main idea, or procedures in the classroom that require multiple steps, or any other task that uh, you might have students do that requires different pieces. That's what we call procedural knowledge, multi-step uh, processes. A second thing would be declarative knowledge. I'm going to call this kernels of knowledge um, here, little pieces, kind of like kernels of corn, right? And the idea here with declarative knowledge is that these are facts. These are pieces of information. It might be definitions of vocabulary words and so on. And so when you're teaching students declarative knowledge, the way that you are going to give an explanation might differ somewhat from the way you do it when you have procedural knowledge. The modeling and practice uh, piece of, way of thinking about things applies no matter what you're doing. If it's something simple and short, something more complex, doesn't matter. All the time, modeling is going to apply. Um, but I do want to be clear that we have, I've sort of created these course categories. I call this a heuristic. A heuristic is a non-theoretical but conceptually useful model. The idea being that this is a way to think about this in terms of procedural and the of knowledge, but I'm not laying this out in uh, sort of the the way that learning theorists might do. We haven't thought deeply about this. This is just a helpful way for you to think about it. So I just want to be clear that um, I'm going to be breaking these into categories uh, for the purposes of helping us learn this. But in reality, if a learning theorist were to watch these videos, they would you know, give me the old glasses off, kind of like, what are you doing here kind of thing, because they're going to think that we haven't really captured that. So I just want to be clear about that. So I want to talk then about sort of how to model for different types of knowledge, because the models might look somewhat different even though they're going to have the same components. So first of all, let's talk about the number of steps. This should be obvious to you, that procedural knowledge almost always involves multiple steps, and acquired knowledge does not. They're individual kernels of knowledge, so to speak. In terms of how long the model takes, procedural knowledge uh, objectives can take a few seconds, even if it has multiple steps. It can often take multiple minutes. They are much longer often. Things like getting the main idea don't just take a minute or so. For declarative knowledge, these should be facts, individual pieces of information that few seconds to uh, describe in a model or could take a little bit longer, it won't take minutes and minutes. If it's taking minutes and minutes, you're probably uh, going on too long with your model. Let's talk about the explanation, the plan examples. So in terms of how the explanation is designed, you're going to break the uh, explanation up into bite-sized chunks. That's a term that was used, uh, the bite-sized chunk, the bite-sized example was used uh, in the Martin article to describe breaking this into pieces. And so you're going to design an explanation that breaks it into pieces. In the case of declarative knowledge, you're going to describe the key idea or a definition really clearly and concisely. It could be, there could be multiple pieces to it, but usually it's one description of the key idea. You're going to show that in the case of, um, of a procedural knowledge objective by writing the steps out in order or stating them as you design them. Typically, there's a checklist just like we have here, a checklist to have the students walk through um, a set of practices they're going to engage in to complete a task. When you have a, a declarative knowledge objective, then the key idea is to have students, or you're going to write out the key idea or state it for students. But typically, for like example, a vocabulary uh, definition, you're going to want to write out vocabulary definition. When you give examples, as you'll talk about here, you will probably want to write out the examples as well. So when you talk about the examples, how do you use plan examples? The teacher in a procedural knowledge context will use worked examples. A worked example is the teacher showing how they would work out the example, how they would do the procedure themselves. That's a worked example. In the case of declarative knowledge, you're not going to do that because there's nothing to sort of uh, work out because it's just a definition of a vocabulary word, for example. So in this case, the teacher elaborates or gives examples of the thing that was the key piece of knowledge that they wanted to, students to acquire. In terms of how these are shown, um, how do you show the plan examples? The teacher illustrates the work's examples, maybe doing it on a smart board or something like that to show students. Um, and with declarative knowledge, the teacher illustrates the examples with images and with words to sort of make that clear. And then multiple models are used by either providing multiple worked examples in the case of procedural knowledge, in the case of declarative knowledge, um, giving multiple illustrative examples linked to that key idea that's in this module, in that model. Um, and so that's a sort of a difference between the ways that these things might work uh, and give you kind of a heuristic to sort of help you think through the rest of this. 
So now I have an activity for you to sort of help you process this even further. So here on the left, you have a set of objectives. And your task right now is to break them into the categories of procedural and declarative. And most of them are pretty clear. There might be a couple that are tricky. And again, that's because it's just sort of a way of thinking that might not always have clear, clear answers for us. But take this opportunity to stop and jot, write your thoughts in the uh, well, in your workbook, not on the screen, um, the, which type of knowledge it is, and then we'll come back and I'll tell you what I think the answers are. So go ahead and do that and we'll come back together. Okay, so let me tell you what I think the answers are for these. So first of all, in terms of the responding when teacher puts out the hands for response, this is probably the trickiest one. I call it declarative knowledge. Why? Because it's just one thing to know. You just need to know one thing to do, but it is a procedure, one step procedure, but a procedure nonetheless. It's something you do, which is the data of a procedure. I think either way, it's okay. Um, but to me, because it's just one step, it's sort of declarative. This is why we call it a heuristic. It's just a way of thinking. It's not sort of, I'm not talking about a deep learning kind of level. So you can see what you think about that one. Either answer is probably right. Here, we had two objectives really, and one was declarative, knowing AW says ah. The other was procedural, knowing that. Uh, using words to, uh, using AW says ah to read words, and that's really uh, what's going on. That's a procedure, using that, uh, that sound spelling to read the words. For writing a subject in important words in each sentence of a paragraph, um, that is going to be procedural, it's multi-step. Using the word immigrant correctly in reference to a text, that is a uh, simple thing to know, kernel of knowledge, so that's declarative. Students will identify causes and effects. Understanding the cause and effect relationship is Definitely procedural, so that if it's the procedural piece. Executing an experiment, also procedural, and finally identifying the properties of triangles, that is declarative. And yes, there are multiple uh, uh, triangle types there, uh, different triangles, but they're still individually declarative. It's not a process, it's something you know. Okay, so that's an example of how that works. So let's talk further about matching the explanation to the learning outcome. So, We've talked now about procedural and declarative knowledge. I want to talk further now about matching to the learning outcome. That was the, per that was the focus of the entire first part of this, uh, this module. And so now let's talk about how these things fit together. So let's talk about matching the explanation and the learning outcome. That's the coolest animation we have in the whole thing. You're not going to see that again, but um, not too bad. So anyway, so match the explanation to the learning outcome. The explanation describes the actions required to reach the learning outcome. It's clear and concise, as we'll talk about later. So that's what the explanation is about. The learning outcome, then, is, as we've already talked about, the behaviors we're going to see that show the mastery of the objective, either development of the skill or acquisition of the knowledge that students are acquiring. And the match is putting those things together. The explanation helps meet the learning outcome. So let's now take an example from uh, Dr. Archer. So Dr. Archer, um, in the video you saw in the first part of this, she does a thing where she has students respond correlately after a teacher signal. And to get them to do this, she had, she had a very specific thing that she asked students to do. So, uh, sorry, she had a very, thing is not the right word, a very specific explanation that she had that matched the learning outcome. So let's look at these two things and see how they match up. So look for yourself. How do you think we can match up these two pieces? So I'll tell you what I think. There are two things that she says to match them to the learning outcome. First, she wants to, she has a teacher signal, and she tells them in her explanation what the signal is. Teacher signal, put up my hands. The second piece is she wants them to respond correlate. She wants them to say the answer, and she wants you to after thinking, not blurting. So she says, say the answer, and that's how she gets to respond correlate. So her explanation is directly linked to the learning outcome. And that's what we want to see in all of these modules, in, or in all of your lessons, not in these modules, in all of your lessons. We want to see you matching the learning outcome to the explanation. The explanation should be focused on getting students to do what it is you expect them to do by the end. And hopefully, because of the learning you've done in part one of this, uh, of this module, you now understand the importance of a learning outcome that matches the objective and that uh, that needs to be very concrete and observable, that you're going for something specific. So if you're specific, you should be able to explain it pretty clearly. So that's matching the explanation of the learning outcome. Now let's talk about designing the explanation. I can't stress enough how important it is to design a good explanation. Uh, 
I often find that my lessons go astray from the very beginning if I don't do a good job of, dis of explaining uh, what I want students to do. Either I don't describe the knowledge very well, or I haven't thought through the procedure in enough detail, and that leads to ambiguity and lack of clarity on the part of students. When I work in classrooms now, because I often go to classrooms, I spend a lot of time focusing on the explanations. I work with teachers, and when I demonstrate lessons, because I don't have my own classroom, I actually spend time writing out my own explanations before I do the lesson. Obviously, on a day-to-day -day basis, that isn't going to be something you'll do. But for the purpose of learning this module, and as a good practice whenever you're teaching something you're not familiar with or that's very complicated, my recommendation is to carefully design the explanation in the way that we discuss it here. If you are teaching a secondary prevention program, they may have done you the favor of creating good explanations already. And if they do, that's great. But as we've already talked about, you often find that even a good program doesn't always have clear explanations, and you need to come up with them. And often the demonstrations I do are from published programs. And I have to adapt them because when I think about the way they want me to explain it, it isn't clear. Or, in a lot of cases, they describe what the activity is, but they don't come up with an explanation for students that's clearly linked to the learning outcome. And I, if I don't have that explanation, the lesson doesn't go as well. So I really want to encourage you to use this process of designing good explanations uh, as you teach, whether or not you have a program, because it will lead to better instruction. It's the bedrock of a mo good model is to have a good, clear explanation. So let's talk now about what a good explanation looks like. The first thing is that the explanation is correct. It's accurate and complete. I'll say more about what that means. It also needs to be clear, immediately comprehensible, with the simplest possible vocabulary, without being awkward sounding, which is actually sort of <laughs> awkward sounding, but that's OK. Um, and then finally, uh, concise. Uh, so those are the elements of a good, clear explanation. Why is it important for us to focus on explanations? I said already, like, I love it. Like, I think it's, I, don't just love it. I think it's great. I think it's, well, I don't think it's great and that I love it, but I think it's important, OK? Um, and that's been true in my experience. I've seen it work really well. But let's go beyond my experience. Like, let's not rely on Devin here. Let's, let's think about, in a larger sense, why might precision be necessary, particularly for students who have learning disabilities and difficulties. And I think that this goes to the core deficit that we think of in learning disabilities and difficulties. For those of you who know the law uh, that refocuses on the definition of disabilities in the IDEA legislation that um, was uh, passed in 2004, the definition of learning disabilities looks like this. And there's a key phrase here that I want to highlight, that I will highlight in a moment. So let's see if you can pick out what is the key phrase here. If you picked out this key phrase, Disorder in one of the basic psychological processes involved in understanding or using language. So you can maybe encircle the word language there. That's the critical piece. So the thing is that students who need intensive intervention often struggle with the language. Language is a challenge for them because that's the nature of a learning disability, is difficulty processing language. It's not always processing vocabulary and syntax. Sometimes it's processing uh, spoken information, um, but it, uh, meaning sort of like the cognitive processing of how you say speech sounds and how you use them to read words. But it is often the case that students struggle with using vocabulary and syntax. And if that's the case, we must do a good job of giving them a clear explanation. We do that because we can best help our students in this way. We need to manage our language so students can learn better. If we don't manage our language, it's sort of sort of like you know, throwing a fistful of pebbles at the bowl. They're not going to hit it because students are going to be overwhelmed by the amount of language. And that is the point I'm making here, is that the cognitive load becomes unmanageable if you don't manage your own language. That's why you have to come up with a clear explanation. Um, and this is sort of the key point. We're going to be clear so we can help the students. We're going to put it on ourselves to be clear so they don't have to figure out what we're trying to say. We're going to tell them the right stuff to begin with, and it'll go smoothly from there. Think back to the lessons I told you about that I did. And remember, I described that sometimes I was like thinking through, the, as I was teaching, like, what, so what, are we, what am I doing here? What, what do I want them to know about um, you know, SQ3R? And I didn't know. I hadn't done a good job planning. I didn't write out a clear explanation. 
What did that do? Put all the cognitive load on the students to sort of figure out what I hadn't even figured out. We're not going to do that. We need to be very clear to benefit the students. So what I'm going to talk about now is how to create a very precise clear explanation that will lower the cognitive load for students who have intensive intervention needs for whom language is really challenging. So let's talk about how to do that. Should we? All right, let's go. So first, it needs to be correct, both accurate and complete. What do I mean about accurate and complete? I want to say that this is a fundamental and non-negotiable thing that you need to, that to do. I say this because you got to know your stuff. Okay? If you don't know it, all is lost. And it's not just that you need to know a little bit about it and rely on your secondary prevention program. You really need to understand it yourself because I've observed other teachers struggle even with a program that provided a lot of even the language to teach when they didn't actually understand what the purpose of it was and how the procedure was designed to work. And I've experienced this in myself. I say, oh yeah, I've got that. I know how to divide fractions or whatever. And then I realized, not only did I not know it that well procedurally, I really didn't understand the concept either. I wasn't able to explain it clearly to students. That's why you got to know your stuff. And so it's non-negotiable. So I'll just say that as a fact. Um, to be accurate, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that you're going to specify all the critical elements of that. And this will come in when we talk about um, complete in a minute as well. But you need to get to the critical elements of it. You can't miss anything. You can't leave anything out. You want to make sure that whatever you do, it's not wrong in any way. Don't add incorrect facts. Don't have a procedure that's imprecise and unclear like I described I often did. And make sure that it doesn't have misspellings or incorrect grammar. I'll also add here that um, tense should also match. If you're defining a vocabulary word that's an adjective, your definition should be an adjective form. It's not accurate if you don't do that. So those are things that you need to make sure that you do. So the key here is to make sure that your explanation includes all the critical elements and doesn't have any of these things. So let's take a look at a lesson. Uh, this is Ms. Peters. She teaches first grade at a school I've worked at in Rhode Island. And Ms. Peters is teaching a lesson on AW uh, that says AW, as I showed you already. There was a reason. We're going to watch this video. So I want you to look at her lesson. See if she is, uh, she's talking about pronouncing the A-W as ah, and also reading words contain the A-W that says ah. Um, so those are both declarative and procedural knowledge as I laid out in the, uh, in the activity we did on that. What I want you to look at is in her instruction, is the explanation accurate? This is a very short clip, and I'm actually going to put up the language that she uses as you see it. So take a look at Ms. Peters and see what you think about the accuracy of her uh, explanation. So go ahead and watch the clip with me. Boys, we have a new sound today. Aww. Can you say the sound? Aww. Aww. Everyone say it again. Aww. OK, really short, as I told you. So let's talk about her explanation. Now let's be clear that the students kind of did it for her. <laughs> they already explained it to her. She said there's a new sound. She pointed at it. They already knew what it was. Um, and so she then, instead of actually giving them the explanation, she told them to say it again. So they had to say the sound again. So is that accurate? So the key here is that it has to include um, the correct uh, critical elements. So it is, in fact, absolutely correct that AW says aw, and she did that uh, correctly. The only thing that's missing here is that she didn't include the spelling is A-W. It's written right there, so it's not a big thing. But she didn't actually say specifically A-W says ah. That would have been an improvement here. There's nothing wrong, and I added here just to note that this is a routine procedure, and so the students are looking at this. Uh, they've seen it a lot, so maybe she didn't feel it's necessary. My view would be probably good to make sure that they know A-W are the letters that say ah. But in general, I think her explanation even though the students kind of did it for her, was clear that this is the sound ah. So that's a good example of a clear explanation, and one that has some places we can work on as well. So let me give you some advice about how to write an accurate explanation. So the first thing to do to make sure that you've got all the key elements in there is to visualize that learning outcome again. Know where you're going. If you don't have that clear learning outcome, your explanation is not going to be any good because you're going to be kind of floundering. Although, trying to write the explanation is a good way to realize you don't actually get it. So it's not such a bad idea just to go ahead and try writing that explanation, even if it isn't fully formed in your head. Uh, and so that'll help sort of actually writing the explanation will help you. It might actually even help you uh, go back and refine your learning outcome as well. 
this process will help you realize the pieces that you don't actually understand about it. Because as you try to write steps in a procedure or describe the elements of uh, some knowledge, you realize that there are pieces that are unclear to you. If you don't know, seek guidance. The big one here I would put like a big star around is use your teacher's guide. I say that because I didn't. My first and second year teacher, I had teacher's guides for programs. Some of them are better, some of them worse, but I didn't use them. I thought, no, I, I learned some stuff in my uh, teaching program, and I thought, yo, I, I've got this. I can figure this out. What I didn't realize was that the teacher's guides had a lot of good stuff in them. My reading program actually had an entire glossary uh, that was really a textbook on how to teach reading that included a lot of detail about the nature of reading. I didn't even know it was there. I finally saw it two years later when my instructional coach said, you really ought to read the teacher's guide. So I did, and then things were better. And so that's a great place to start is to see what the teacher's guide has to say about the concept that you're teaching. And it may be a lesson you're teaching next week, and so you feel like, oh, I got that lesson. It'll show me what to do then. No, go ahead and look at it now to make sure that the you can use the teacher's guide as a reference. Um, and that's important because what I'm saying is the teacher's guide might not have the specificity of how to write the, the explanation, but they certainly will explain what the explanation should be. So you can work from the guide to give you a, a start for the explanation. Other places to look for guidance are trustworthy online resources. I say trustworthy for an important reason. There's a lot of stuff out there. There are things like Pinterest. I got that face and made that pause for a reason. Pinterest, again, face, pause, is not an ideal place to find good resources. I'm not going to say that it's all bad. There's good stuff there. People who are very thoughtful educators have put good things on there. But there's a lot of stuff on there also that's not high in quality. I've looked at it myself, and I see really great variation. So you want to make sure you look at trustworthy online resources. I would start with websites that are designed by people who know a lot about intensive intervention. One place I'd really recommend is the National Center for Intensive Intervention, who is doing these courses. You probably are seeing this video because you know about the National Center, but if you have not seen the website, Go to intensiveintervention.org, and they have on that website online resources to help you with your instruction. And you can use those online resources to understand better how to write a good, clear explanation. In fact, they have lessons in reading and math that are designed to do just that for you. So find those good online resources. Don't use Pinterest, usually. And be really careful with something like Teachers Pay Teachers, which I don't know if this exists at the time you're watching this video, but when I, this time in history, um, Teachers Pay Teachers is a website where people can pay other teachers for uh, materials that they've designed. And some of them are good, and some of them are not. So be very careful with, with tools like that, because you don't know what's trustworthy within it. Then we have your colleagues, talk with your teachers, and finally workshops. Seek out guidance elsewhere. There are lots of places you could go. And you can go to places like the National Center to get some ideas about what workshops you might attend. They also have workshops in the form of webinars and so on. And finally, if you're not sure, punt. And you might be wondering, what do I mean by punt? Have you not heard that expression before? Punting in football, for those of you who don't know, is when you basically can't get as far as you need to, and you've got to give the ball up, and you kick it all the way down the field um, to give it to the other team. The, the analogy here is, if you don't know, just, just give up for that day, not forever. Just, just stop. You know? Stop the lesson, say, we're going to come back to this tomorrow, which I wish I had done in some of my lessons as a first and second year teacher. There are always other things I could have taught. I didn't need to sort of go on and on with that lesson. If I'd stopped, that would have been good, because then I could have sought the guidance I needed and tried the lesson again once I felt uh, more capable. And so I could have written a clear explanation so I wouldn't have these problems that I had in some of my early lessons. So that's my recommendation for how to create an accurate response. The second piece here is complete. Complete is just as important as accurate. And this is important because a lot of times what I find is, and this happened to me a lot as a new teacher, is I had incomplete explanations. And I should add, not just a new teacher, this happens to me a lot even now. Uh, it happened to me as I was writing these modules, I wrote this material, I would write something and I would realize there was something missing. And so I made a lot of changes to these as I went because I realized that I had not completely explained everything. So this is something that happened throughout your career, is that you will not have a complete explanation. If you are already a veteran of 10, 15 years, 
I guarantee you there are explanations you've written or thought of that aren't always complete, that you thought of part of the task, but not all of it. So the complete explanation has to include everything needed to do the skill or all of the aspects of the idea. It also needs to match the learning outcome exactly and for those big ideas, break them into parts, into bite-sized pieces or chunks. And we're never leaving students to kind of figure things out on their own. All of the pieces are there. Okay? So I'll give you an example of this. Uh, here's an example of a procedural example. Retell the story by looking back at the story carefully, write what happened. This is not a good complete explanation. Why? It's missing critical information. What do you do when you look back? It does not specify. How should you be careful? It does not specify. That requires you to figure out what, what that means. And then how do you decide what to write? Not even mention. It's not broken into those, bro it's not breaking that complex idea into parts so students can digest it in a really sort of linear fashion. They're going to have to do a lot of extra thinking outside of what is written here. So this is not a good explanation. This is a description of physics. In physics, you want to understand how things work and why they work the way they do. So that's a fact about the definition of physics. What do you think about that one? Think about that for a second as a definition for physics. I'm going to tell you I don't think this is a good example. Why? Maybe mumbling something to yourself or thinking maybe you're looking up the definition of physics right now. It's not definition of physics. It's missing a lot of information about physics. Uh, there's a lot more to physics than understanding how things work and why they work the way they do. How things work is really broad. A lot of stuff works and doesn't work that has nothing to do with physics. I guess ultimately everything's physics, but, but not in a sort of day-to-day -day sense. And so that's not a good definition of that. It is missing critical information um, that's not going to help. It's going to result in students not understanding. So, Take a look at another video example. So this here is Ms. S, and she's teaching a strategy called Fix It. Her strategy, Fix It, is designed to help students recognize when they read a sentence incorrectly because it doesn't make sense in context, and then to use a strategy called Fix It when they're uh, reading to, to, make a, to make a change to it, to make it correct. So I want you to look at this example and see whether or not you think Ms. S's explanation is complete in the way we described. So let's take a look at Ms. S's lesson. I've got the objective written there. I'll move over here. It's a little bit easier for you to see. So, go ahead and watch the lesson with me. When we practice making sure that when we read, it makes sense. It has to look right, but it also has to make sense. And there's a question that might help you if you're reading. You can ask yourself, does that make sense? And if the answer is no, I need to go back and try to fix it. So, it can make sense. Okay. We're going to do a game called Fix It to practice. So, here's a sentence. And if I read this sentence, and I read, the bus stepped at the corner. Does it make sense? No. Turn back to me. Who would like to share your thinking? Does it make sense? So let's talk about that uh, example. So we have a good example to help us process this information. So here's what she said. I just got it, I've got it written there. And so let's talk about whether or not it was a clear explanation for what she wanted to do. I'm going to move over here so I'm not like <laughs> sort of in the middle of her face there. So, so let's talk about the first thing here, which is um, her first objective was to recognize a sentence doesn't make sense. And so the language, ask yourself, did that make sense, does that. So the explanation is clear in that way. Um, you know, it's very, it's very, it's accurate. So this is what you want to do. It, didn't, it, didn't, it doesn't make sense. You want to say it made sense. So in that sense, it's good. So let's look at another key piece of this. So our second objective was to apply the fix-it strategy. So here's what the fix-it strategy is. Try to fix it is what she says. And this is a problem. Trying to fix it isn't a clear explanation of what to do. So in that sense, it's not a complete explanation. Half of it is there with the did that make sense. The rest of it is not there because the students don't have a strategy to help them try to fix it. I often worry about strategies like this, particularly ones that focus on using context, because sometimes if students don't have more guidance, they don't know how to actually do it. If they understand the idea of fixing things by making sense of them intuitively, I'm not sure why I would even teach the lesson. If they don't understand that, this isn't going to be enough guidance to help them do that. So it could be a real challenge here. And also, I want to add that when you're teaching kids about um, pronunciation, it's also really key to ask them to think about the, uh, the sounds and the letters and the words as well, which isn't part of what she describes here. 
But we don't know if she thinks that's important because she didn't describe what it means to try to fix it. So if we're talking about how to create a correct explanation, here's some, guide, here's some guidance I have for you about how to create a good explanation. So one is to make sure it matches that learning outcome exactly. So if, if it's going to be complete, it has to get through all of the pieces in the procedure. Um, so you're going to break it into those chunks if it's a procedure. If it's declarative, make sure you define and describe it clearly. Um, and I'm going to say more about the clear when I get to the next piece of that as well. So you need to make sure it matches your learning outcome. That's one way to make sure it's complete. The second thing to do is to write it out. Write it, read it aloud, reread it, try doing it using your explanation. That's one thing I do a lot. So one of my other jobs is to design curricula. I actually design programs for teachers to teach. And I got to be sure that what I wrote actually works, that it makes sense, as we just talked about in the video. Different kind of makes sense. But I always think about does it make sense. And when I try to figure out if it makes sense, what I have to do is to actually try out what I'm writing. If I just say it, to myself even. It doesn't always work. I need to say, these are the steps. Let me follow those steps and see how it actually works. So you want to do that too. Read it aloud, reread it, try doing it. Try using it with an adult. Sort of like, you know, I always like to say like, you know, make your friends and neighbors' lives miserable. Um, and maybe not your, your spouse and your children if you have them. Um, but, uh, but definitely, you know, work on it with other adults. You know, they might appreciate being you sort of working things out with them. And even if they don't, you need some help. So get it from them. Ask them to tell you whether or not they could do something based on the explanation you gave. And push them to, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, yeah, that seems pretty good to me. Make them do it. Like, can they follow your steps? If they can, great. If not, you're going to have to do some work. And even if you like it, rewrite it, even if it's just a little bit. And that's something that I do a lot is I try to change the language a little bit to make sure I haven't left anything out. And you'll see more examples of this a little bit later when I talk about different explanations for a lesson that I constructed with somebody else. And once I then write the rest of the lesson, I can come back to um, correct it and make sure it's complete. I might realize halfway through, I missed something. I need to add it in. That actually happened when I was writing this very part of this module. I need to add something in later on. And so I had to go back and change my explanation in order to make it more complete. Um, and so. As a result, we uh, had a more complete explanation, just like you want to do. And the, this is sort of a guide for how to come up with a good, complete explanation. So there you go. So now I talked about being correct in what you describe. Here's a summary of all the aspects of being correct. And you can follow this to sort of help you. And we're going to use this now to evaluate a curriculum example. So this is a curriculum example. This is actually from the National Center website. Um, and this is a description of the steps in doing uh, uh, three-digit addition with and without regrouping. So this is a procedure that was designed for that purpose. So go ahead and read this procedure and then look at our criteria for accuracy and completeness and decide whether or not you think it meets those criteria. So you can pause the video and do this because um, I'm not going to read it to you. I'll refer to it in, uh, when, once you've done the activity. Uh, but sort of just pause it and take a look. You don't need to write anything down. This isn't a formal activity. But just think to yourself, does this make sense as a, an accurate and complete uh, explanation. So go ahead and pause the video, read that, and then we'll go on. OK, so here's my thought. I think it is definitely accurate. I think it's definitely complete. Why do I think it's accurate? I think it's accurate because this is a standard algorithm. There are other kinds of algorithms that are actually mentioned in the National Center uh, sort of language so, because that's something that teachers are often expected to teach students with multiple algorithms. But we're just doing the standard one for now. Um, it is not the only one, though, I want to stress. Um, this is correct, right? There's nothing wrong with any of this. So that's good. So it's accurate. Is it complete? Yeah, it is. And I think it's really great because it actually has in it a piece that allows you to deal with it if it has regrouping, but it also works even if you don't have regrouping. How great is that? This explanation is so carefully designed that it accounts for both procedures. And even though it has eight steps, all of them are written pretty simple. Um, it's perfectly matched. It has those individual steps in order. And there's nothing for students to guess at. They can do this well. It does necessitate understanding place value and understanding the idea of regrouping. So, if students don't understand that, this procedure will not work. But if students have that background knowledge, 
this is a very nice, complete explanation. So uh, that's why it's on the website. Uh, you could probably have guessed that it was a good explanation. All right, let's look at a different explanation. So here's an explanation for um, how to understand the vowel consonant E pattern that makes the long sound in words. And I'll just describe to you briefly um, what this pattern is. The idea here is that when you have a word that has a vowel, a consonant, and the letter E, which you can see there, when you have a vowel and the letter E, like in um, cake, okay, when you have that pattern, that the pattern A and the consonant and the E makes the long sound. The A says its name, and this is sometimes called magic E, because people say that the E makes the A say its name. This is also the same thing in bike and so on. The E makes the I say its name, I, rather than saying I. Yeah. So that's the, that's the idea here. So I'd like you to pause the video and read this to yourself. And again, this is just one that you don't have to, um, you don't have to, it's not a formal activity, but just take a look at it in your workbook and see what you think, and I'll tell you sort of my thoughts about that. I'm also going to race the board while you do this, so go ahead and pause the video. I'll race the board. We'll come back and do it. Okay, I'm back. Board erased. Okay, so this is different. Here, it's not accurate at all. The skill, which this is designed to do, I found this on a website, it's designed to teach this to students. The skill itself is not really described. There are not facts related to this. This is an allegory, but it's not accomplishing its objective. This is the objective of this lesson, but this is not describing the objective at all. It's not going to lead students to it. In that sense, it's like not complete. There's no even way to think about it being complete. There are no steps because there's no procedure. It might help students with pronunciation, so in that sense, maybe it matches that aspect of the learning outcome. It says vowels say your name, but it doesn't specify what the name is um, for even a particular letter. So that's a real problem here. And the big thing here is that um, this is n not going to help students understand the skill. They're going to have to kind of infer from all of this language what they're expected to understand about the vowel consonant e pattern. And that is a real problem. So this is a good example of a bad example. This is a curriculum example. It's actually from, uh, it's, it's not from a, it's not from a cr published curriculum, but it's from a published website. And I did not put this in here because I wanted to tell the, you know, writers of this that they did a bad job um, because they actually also did a good job. This was, though, the activity they recommended for teachers to use to introduce students to the concept. But they actually also wrote another explanation that was designed for teachers. But if this was the explanation for students, I want you to think about whether or not this would be a good explanation. And this is, in fact, an activity. So I want you to do this on your own. Take the time to pause the video. For this one, write down your thoughts instead of uh, just sort of like waiting for me to do it and then writing them down. This time, do it yourself and then see what, how your answers compare to mine. So take a look at this example, compare it to the criteria for accuracy and completeness, and, we'll, and then you can come back and we'll talk about what I thought. OK, so now, what do we think? Better, yeah? It's better. It's a lot better. Um, and so is it accurate? It's mostly correct. It, it's not clear whether or not it's supposed to help with patterns like IE, where the two vowels are next to each other, because it says close behind, with usually with no more than one letter in between, which suggests it could be no letters in between. So that would work for EE and IE and OE and UE. It doesn't work for AE. Um, but so that actually, like, that could be true, but it's not clear on that point. But it, it does seem correct. There are no apparent inaccuracies. Is it a complete explanation? Well, I'm not sure it's necessary to add usually. Like, may, it is probably true that there are cases where that isn't the case. It did, but they're teaching it as a pattern, and it probably at the beginning is not necessary to, uh, to add that. It's almost overcomplete in that sense, but it isn't incorrect in that sense. Um, it matches the first part of the objective, and the second part is obvious as a natural extension of that. There's nothing for students to intuit. What I think is really interesting about this example is that the authors of this example designed it as an explanation for teachers, when I think actually it's an OK explanation for students. I might change the language somewhat, but we're not talking about language yet. We're talking just about completeness. This does describe the pattern. And it is, by implication, as I said here, 
it would lead to the second part of the objective, which is reading the words. So it's pretty good. And it's interesting because when the authors wrote the one that was designed for kids, I guess, for first graders, uh, second graders, third graders who have intensive intervention needs, they had a sort of more analogical kind of fun way of doing it that may not have been, is it certainly not optimal in terms of learning the skill. So I want to give the authors of this a compliment here, but I also want to show you that this is an example of where sometimes the way we design things might not be optimal for Turing learning. It ends up not being complete. Okay, so we talked about being correct, accurate and complete. Now let's talk about being clear. Clear is so important. It's all important. <laughs> I'm just going to go on. Clear is important. Okay. All right, so comprehensible. What do I mean by comprehensible? It's concrete. For something to be comprehensible, you need to make sure that the language you use is language students can follow. It also needs to be focused without any extra stuff in it. It needs to be easy to follow so that students can sort of get it as they go. So let me give you some, some examples and we can see whether or not they're concrete, focused, and easy to follow. So in terms of that, here's an example of uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Powell, who you met in uh, the first part of this module. Um, and she says here, for part of explanation of uh, regrouping, she said, I'm going to regroup 110 for 10 ones. And I think that's quite concrete. 110, 10 ones, you need to understand what those things are. But if you do, it's very clear language. It's focused in that it's, um, there's nothing extra in it that tells you how to do that regrouping, and it is easy to follow. I can see what that looks like. Um, 1, 10, 10, 1s is weird language in a way. But the way she has it written, 1, 10 for 10, 1s makes it clear, so it's easy to follow. Rhyming words sound the same at the end. Very uh, concrete. Rhyming words sound the same at the end. I can see sound the same. I can see at the end. It's not entirely precise. It doesn't say exactly what rhyming is, where it's the vowel and everything after it. But it is good um, because it's focused. It's only, it sticks just to the simplest p a way to explain it, which makes it easy to follow. We could write a longer explanation of rhyming, but you also then have to question, is it worth the extra effort to have that longer definition? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, but I just want to emphasize here that I think that's actually still a good comprehensible explanation of rhyming, even if it doesn't have a lot of extra stuff in it. Let's look at a third one. Light things are easy to pick up, heavy things are hard to pick up. So this is a description of uh, well, those two vocabulary words. Is it concrete? Very concrete. Light, easy to pick up. Heavy, hard to pick up. Really easy to see that. It's focused just on the definitions, and it's really easy to follow. That may seem like sort of like a super basic example, but that actually was from a lesson that was designed by a student of mine for a three-year-old with autism spectrum disorder. Um, and she designed the explanation to teach him some simple vocabulary, and it worked really well for her and for him because she was so focused in doing it. So I think that's a good example. Concrete, focus, easy to follow, comprehensible uh, explanation. So let's take some other examples, and some ones that maybe aren't so, aren't so ideal in this way. So let's look at this one, which is for a procedural objective. We can rewrite fractions when the number of parts in each whole are the same. 3 fourths plus 1 fourth. And this is actually directly from a curriculum example, from a video of a teacher doing a lesson. She reads this directly from the manual. So this is very confusing to me as an explanation. Here's why. But think about it. Um, there's not a lot of, there's a lot of vague terms that aren't concrete. Parts, whole, some, same. Those things are sort of nebulous words. It's not that they're bad words, the students know them, but they're used in sort of vague ways here. Um, they're not used in kind of in a precise mathematical way that might make it clearer. And this whole phrase, parts in each whole are the same, is really difficult to unpack, so it's not at all easy to follow. It took me like a minute to figure out what's going on here. Some of you still probably are like, I do not understand what they're asking us to do here. Um, the number of parts in each whole are the same, meaning um, there are four parts in the whole, right? So you can do, uh, you can rewrite the practice by adding them together. That is a very complex way of, of explaining that idea that could be much better clarified. And that's from a program. So again, programs don't always get it right. We need to help them out. Here's a declarative one. Um, so data is another word for information we collect about something. This one is better. I think it, is, it does a better job of describing and uh, defining what data, what data is or data are. Um, and, but it has a vague term about something. And so I'm not sure what it means to be about something. I'm, 
I understand why the writer did this uh, because like uh, collect, if you just said information we collect, it's sort of an odd sort of thing to, to say, but maybe there's a different way to say that that might be clearer. And then collecting about something, collect about, like is that a phrase students will understand to collect about? I don't think it's that easy to follow actually. It's not a bad one, it's much better than the first, but it could be even clearer I think in terms of helping students understand the nature of this objective or of this explanation. So let's talk about these with some um, different explanations that I've written to help you think this through. I've written some of them, some of them I've taken from curricula. But your task now is to decide if they are or are not comprehensible. So take a look at these, think them through, and then write your thoughts about whether or not it's comprehensible using these three criteria, and then we'll come back together. So good luck with that. Have fun. It's fun. It's fun, right? So have fun. And then when you're done, we can talk about it. Uh, we can review my thoughts. Done? Good? All right. So let me talk about this um, in terms of my own thinking. So first, let's talk about this one on congruence. Is it comprehensible? Um, I think it's concrete, but it does have some extraneous information that might make it harder to follow. We practically do something again and again. Very simple declarative, but it is concrete. The phrases do something and again and again are really common, so that's great. And then, uh, so it makes it all easy to follow. This is an objective on uh, using a measuring cup. So uh, here, I think this is concrete. Um, it's very clear what to do. Most of the nouns and verbs are imageable. You can see what the procedure is, and it's focused and easy to follow. I can actually imagine how you might use that information. This one is not concrete. There's some really vague language like go between and go to and staying on, and that makes it hard to understand what's going on here. It is focused, though, on the steps. There's, everything here is something you would do to make a lowercase d. It's just the way it has been done makes it hard to follow. So that one is not concrete, and that's a big problem here. This one sort of has the opposite problem. It is concrete. It says exactly what to do. All the language is precise in the sense that I can understand and image what the things are that are happening. But there's a lot of extra stuff, and that's going to make it harder to follow. So Often when you have a lesson that is, is hard to follow, it's because it has a lot of extra information in it. So that's something you want to make sure to avoid. So, uh, so that gives a sense of whether or not something is comprehensible. So you need to have some, some ideas for that. It's so important to be clear that I'm wearing a different shirt. Just to remind you how important it is, purple shirt, to be clear. So clear. When we're clear about our, expl our clear explanation, it has the simplest possible vocabulary and syntax. Let me talk about, let me st start by talking about the vocabulary. Let me try to say things clearly. Let me start by talking about the vocabulary. When I say the simplest possible vocabulary, I mean it's at the student's current level of performance. Use words that are very concrete. We know exactly what they mean. And we include phrases in our vocabulary that students are familiar with. Let me give you a couple examples of uh, definitions for a word, for an idea that I think are appropriate depending on the level of the student. So here we have rhyming words. Rhyming words are words that sound the same at the end. They have the vowel and the consonant, everything after it that says the rhyme, rhyming sound, right? For students, you wouldn't say it the way I just said it because that wasn't clear. I was actually borrowing from the things I have written here. One way you could explain that is to say that a rhyming word has the same vowel and sounds after it. That could be appropriate for a student who's been made familiar with the idea of a vowel and with the sounds after it. For many students, though, they may not understand what a vowel is because it's sort of a tricky concept that could be confusing for them. So for some students, it might be appropriate just to say that rhyming words sound the same at the end. So you could choose one of these depending on the level of the student. On margin, I would say this one is most appropriate for students because students who are learning about, learning about rhyming words are typically at a kindergarten or first grade level, in which case this, this simple definition is probably best. But to be clear, we want to make sure that the vocabulary is appropriate. We want to make sure that it's at the student's instructional level. So I think here of tiers of words. Some of you may be familiar with um, the robust vocabulary book by Beck, McCowan, and Kukan, and they talk about the importance of using academic language, academic vocabulary. 
So in many cases, you're going to want to use these kinds of words to help students understand the content. Um, and you're going to want to teach them how to use these generally useful academic words throughout their learning so they can apply them in one subject but across subjects. So you want to make sure that you provide this academic language, but it needs to be at the student's instructional level. You also want to make sure you use discipline-specific names for things. So in mathematics, for example, you want to make sure you use the right words. And for example, in English language arts, you want to be sure to talk about protagonists, not just the main character, as students get into higher level English language arts. So in social studies, terms like constitutional, and so on. So you want to make sure you use language specific to the discipline. I'll give you one other math example, which is regroup. Regroup is a term to describe when you uh, change the number of digits in a column in order to facilitate addition or subtraction. It's sometimes called borrowing in a case of subtraction. Now, borrowing, I will tell you, is not math language. I need to be very clear about that because if you uh, watch the videos about mathematics by uh, Dr. Sarah Powell, she will tell you that this kind of word is not a good math word. I'll go back to that. Never say borrow because it's not mathematical language. It doesn't describe what you do when you change things from ones to tens and tens to ones. That's called regrouping, and that's the appropriate mathematics language. So that's the vocabulary. Let's change over to syntax. By syntax, I mean the way the sentence is structured, the grammar of the sentence. And I'm going to give you some examples of things that you should not do when you write syntax for your sentences. One thing to avoid is the passive voice. The passive voice is when you sort of bury the subject by putting it late in the sentence. And so, for example, you would say the videos were watched by them. Really, the videos are about them, like they watch the videos. But now you're kind of burying the subject by putting it at the end of the sentence. And instead of saying that they watch, it was were watched. And so that becomes the passive voice. We're not talking actively about who's doing something. And that's confusing for students because students benefit from the clarity of having concrete concepts described in sentences that begin with a concrete definition of a noun and are followed by a verb that's highly imageable. So if we say they watch the video, that is clear. And you know, you could say you were watching them. You could say the videos were watched by you in this case, right? But you could say you watched the videos and hopefully they're not too terrible. Another thing to avoid is complex sentences. Com often, complex sentences are sentences where there's a main cause and a dependent clause. That's actually always what those are. And you usually want to avoid complex sentences, although in some cases, given students' instructional level, it may be appropriate to use them. So you want to make sure that if you're going to use complex sentences, uh, you don't do it too often and at a different level of instruction than the student. If you're using complex sentences, they're going to have words like this to connect the subordinate conjunction and the main clause of a sentence. But often they can be confusing for students. For example, while they're watching the videos, the cat escaped. I hope that your cat is safely in your house right now if you have a cat. Um, but this could be an example of a, uh, a complex sentence that could be confusing for students. Understanding while and then the main clause of the cat escaping, that com combination of things could be confusing for students. It's not always the case that it's confusing. So for some students, this is highly appropriate to use. As students develop their understanding of, for example, reading comprehension concepts, they should be understanding increasingly complex sentences because they will encounter them in many texts. So care with complex sentences, but you don't always want to avoid them entirely. The subjunctive is a complex idea that basically refers to hypotheticals. And often they have words like if, supposing, could, might, and so on. So when you use a subjunctive, it becomes often very confusing for students because, as I already said, the best thing to do is make it concrete. And when you use a subjunctive, it takes it out of that concrete space and requires students to think in a hypothetical way that when you're teaching something new, when you're trying to model, it's not going to be as clear. So here's an example of a lesson that I watched where a teacher said the following to a student about a math problem. So the student had done a math problem involving regrouping, a mathematics term. And the teacher said this after doing 43 minus 19 of the student. So the teacher said, if this had been, um, say we had 17 cards, and this was an 8. Let me move out of the way here. So say we had 17 cards and this was an 8, and this would have been a 7, we wouldn't have to regroup there, okay? 
So the teacher is giving a hypothetical situation that includes very complex syntax to give the student another example of the same thing. What would have been better? To simply give the example, not using hypothetical, just give the actual example. When you're planning, you're going to adjust your vocabulary and syntax as you plan. So you've already seen excerpts from this lesson. One thing you should think about is the fact that we didn't get it right the first time, right? You've already seen us talk about that. So we actually found that, and you can see it in the video here, we came up with three different ways to describe the process of chopping an onion. And when we did this, it was only the third one that we thought actually worked well. So let's look at how we actually made it better over time. We wanted to use more precise discipline-specific vocabulary, discipline here being cooking. So here we have the term chop, and then we have the term slice. And we wanted to make sure that we used the very specific vocabulary. So slice was the idea of sort of cutting through in a sort of, I don't know, a continuous motion, whereas chop is kind of that quick staccato kind of motion. We wanted to make sure that when we were doing this in half, it was clear that we were sort of sliding through there. If you try to chop it, it could end up a little bit like you saw in the video of me at the beginning where I know it's silly, but the onion went everywhere and I was lucky to have all my fingers. Um, so I need to use, we need to use more precise discipline specific vocabulary using slice correctly rather than chop. Then we wanted to simplify the syntax. You can see here some places where the syntax is a little bit confusing, such that if you were a student, it might not be clear enough. So I find here that from the ends or from ends is a confusing way to describe something. Like, what does it mean to be from the ends? From has a lot of different meanings, so it could be confusing. When we write from end to end, that makes it a lot clearer because we all know what it means to go from end to end. We've now used a phrase that has Syntax is going to be more familiar to the reader because this is a phrase with which they're going to be familiar. So you could look here and think about what other things we might be able to change to make this uh, even clearer for the student. What could you imagine might be a way to improve this? Think about that for a second. What are some other changes you might consider making to this? If you said, the on grain piece. Now, grain is not a bad word to use here, but it's not clear what it means to slice on the grain. Like on could mean on top of somehow. Really what we mean is to slice through the grains, right? And we didn't use that terminology, and so that is confusing. So that'd be another thing we would change to make it even clearer. So we've increased our clarity from here to here by changing the vocabulary that we used. Also, and you can see the contrast here from grain on grain to grain to middle makes it a lot clearer because the grains to middle is a much clearer phrase than on grain. I'll give you another example of adjusting vocabulary. This comes from a reading program called Peer Assisted Learning Strategies that was developed by Doug Lynn Fuchs at Vanderbilt University. And in this, um, in this program, students work in pairs. They have a reader and a coach. The other student is not reading. And there's a pr correction procedure that the coach is taught to use if they make a mistake. And in the program, the procedure changed over time. Once upon a time, when the program was first designed, the coach said a particular phrase. And I know this because I actually worked on a study of this, uh, of, this uh, of this technique. And the coach used to say, originally, when they saw the reader made a mistake, they would say, uh, in the 1997 edition, stop, you missed a word. They point at the word, can you figure it out? So that's not a bad way to describe what to do if a student makes a mistake. But we wanted to make it shorter. So my colleague Chris Lemons at Vanderbilt uh, came up with a way to simplify this. So now in the 2008 edition, what do you think we changed this to? How could we possibly shorten this to make it easier for the student, the coach, to do this quickly and simply? If you came up with check it, then you got it. You might probably didn't because I was impressed with Chris's ability to take all of this language, get it down to check it. But really, if you point at the word, it's clear what it is. And check is a word we know that means check to make sure it's correct. In school, we always use that language. So this is an amazing way to take all of this language and get it down to actually just two words. So we've changed the vocabulary to make it clearer and simpler for students. Another example of this comes from getting the gist. 
getting the gist of the strategy that's part of collaborative strategic reading developed by Klingner, Vaughn, and Boardman, um, and along with their colleagues uh, at the University of Texas Austin and University of Colorado. Um, and they, uh, they did a great job designing getting the gist. My colleague, Jade Wexler, Chris Lemons, and I made some adjustments to this in a new version of getting the gist we designed for a new project. We didn't change just very much, so it's really still the same procedure that's in CSR, but we made some slight adjustments. So take a look at these two examples and see how we adjusted the language to make it a little bit different. So what do you think? We changed a few things, right? So we have here name, we changed this to identify. We then, instead of saying, a question here, we made it consistent by using other statement. And we use the same language of identify across these. This strategy is designed for middle school students, so we thought that would be appropriate to use the term identify. It's usually that's appropriate academic language for students. So then we said write the gist in approximately 10 words. We changed to develop a gist statement that is about 10 words. We like the term gist statement because we thought that it was a clear way of describing what students write. They're going to develop a gist statement. It's a, it's a, you know, it's spoken or written. It's a clear sentence that describes this. So we felt it was appropriate to say that. And we also wanted to say that it's about 10 words because we felt like it was helpful to make very clear that um, it doesn't have to be exactly 10 words. It could be a little bit more, a little bit less. Here, when it says approximately 10 words or less, we thought, well, why couldn't we just say about 10 words and capture the idea of approximately? It's kind of confusing in a way to have approximately and or less. There are different versions of the getting the gist strategy, and this is maybe just one that was developed by uh, Klinger, Vaughn, and Boardman colleagues. And so there are probably other versions of this that don't have some of this language. But we pulled this out just to show you the ways in which we slightly adjusted the language. So what do you think? How, how are these changes improvements? Do you think they're improvements? Did we really just tweak things almost so little that it's not worth it? This is something for you to reflect on. Take a minute to make a decision. You can give us a smiley face if you felt like we helped things. And if we didn't, well, you can just say, you know, Devin, it's, it's OK, you know, and we'll just go on. So there we go. That's that. Now we talked about adjusting vocabulary to make it clear. Hopefully, we've done that. A second criterion for uh, being clear is that it's not awkward sounding. If it's not awkward sounding, you can say it the same way again and again. So one thing you often have to do in a lesson is use the same language to describe a concept over and over. For example, light and heavy are two words that a teacher might have to teach a student um, when they're teaching them an explicit instructional lesson. And they uh, teach the vocabulary definition for light. The teacher chose light things are easy to pick up. This is for a third grade student, excuse me, a three-year-old student uh, with autism spectrum disorder taught by a student teacher of mine. She thought that uh, this is a clear way of describing uh, light things. I agree that it is, that those, that's a very clear definition. She also felt she could say that repeatedly without it seeming awkward. And I agree, it's not hard to say light things are easy to pick up repeatedly. A second example of this comes from a lesson that I taught where I used the term, I used the definition, a creative description for a metaphor. You could argue that this is not a complete definition for metaphor, and I agree that it is not. It doesn't contrast with simile and so on. I was teaching third graders this concept, and I felt like this was an appropriate way to do it. You could read here the way in which I use metaphor in the lesson that I taught. This is a script from the lesson I taught. And you can read here, read this to yourself and see how I was able to use the words again and again. How often was I able to use the same terms that I used to define metaphor? I assume you're counting here for a second. If you said four, you got it. Now, here you can see I switched up the language. I didn't say creative description. I said describes creatively. But there are four ways in which I use almost the same definition. Why did it work? It didn't sound awkward. I could say it again and again without sort of thinking to myself, gosh, why did I, come? Why did I say it that way? Which I have done before. I'm sure you've come up with things where you're like, that is so garbled. I don't think students are going to get that. Or I just feel it's like I came up with a weird way to say it. Here I think I did a pretty good job with it. I'll give you a contrasting example. This is from a lesson by a student teacher who wanted to describe the idea of an influence, like an influence on a person, right? So the definition that he came up with is an influence is a person or event that motivates a person to become what they become. Think about that for a second. 
Is that even a correct definition for influence? Read it to yourself. Think about that. I'd actually say, actually it is correct, right? Influence is something that changes your behavior, right? Motivates you to do something different. It's an influence on your life. So I think that that is true. Obviously, just here confined to person, there are different kinds of influences. This is one limited part of the definition. I think that's okay for the lesson that he was teaching. But look at how this would get used in the lesson he taught. He was talking about civil rights. Martin Luther King was an important influence on many other civil rights leaders. He motivated them to become what they became. The entire civil rights movement influenced later activists who campaigned for equal rights for many people. The civil rights movement motivated them to become what they became, civil rights activists. I can't imagine saying become what they became many, many times in a lesson. In fact, it's sort of so, so awkward for me that I actually might forget to say it the right way. I might say it a different way. I might not say it at all. And because of that, I think it's not, it's an awkward sounding way to describe it that's not going to be memorable to me or to the students. How many times could I say become what they became before I just thought to myself, this is just too strange? I'm going to guess like maybe just a couple. I was already sort of you know, tongue-tied trying to say it these couple of times. So let's take another uh, example of a word that we want to make sure we don't have an awkward sounding definition for. So the word is ambivalent. What's the word? You don't have to say it correlate out loud, but I just get used to doing that because we always do this in uh, one of the things I, I work on. So here, that the word is ambivalent. Here are definitions that we came up with from, from online. So here are different definitions for ambivalent that you can look at. So I want you to come up with a non-awkward explanation for ambivalent. Um, and because ambivalent is a tricky word, and you could probably come up with something that maybe works, but it's hard to say. Maybe it's too long. Maybe you know you would it'd be tricky to say. So write out something you think would work, and then test it by saying it out loud to see if like you could say like could I say this like ten times in like half an hour, fifteen times? And if you couldn't, that's not going to work. And if you felt like students couldn't, that's not going to work. So see what you can come up with for a good definition for the word ambivalent. Let's try it out. You can pause the video and think about it, and then I'll tell you what I think. So the explanation I came up with is this one. If you are ambivalent about something, you have two opposite opinions and cannot decide on one. So the phrasing, have two opposite opinions and cannot decide on one, that's the core of the explanation. So here's my test. Let me write a sentence containing the explanation. Some students are ambivalent about universal health care. They have two opposite opinions, so they cannot decide on one. So two opposite opinions cannot decide on one. That works. Two opposite opinions cannot decide on one. I could say that a lot of times. I'm not going to keep saying it to save you the eye roll of that, although that's probably eye rolling just for me to have said that. But <laughs> forgive me. We're filming a lot of stuff here, so it's, you know, you get a little punchy sometimes. Um, so two opposite opinions, they can't decide on one. I chose to go with two, uh, and my reasoning was that when I did it without saying two, it got very confusing. So obviously that's limited because it's not always two, but I felt like that captured it well enough. So I, I decided that this worked because when I said the test, when I read, wrote the sentence, when I then said it out loud, I was like, yeah, that's not too awkward sounding. So hopefully you came up with one that wasn't too awkward sounding. So let's look at an example now. This is from Dr. Anita Archer, who you've seen before. Um, and she's teaching us on cause effect. Her objective is for students to identify cause and effects. And what we want to look at here is what her explanation of cause and effect is. And we want to look at whether or not it itself is smooth and not awkward sounding. So let's go ahead and watch Dr. Archer, and we can think about whether her explanation is uh, not awkward sounding. So go ahead and watch this video with me. We have read this story and we are going to reread it. Uh, and today, the comprehension skill we're going to work on is this it is cause and effect. What is it, everyone? Cause and effect. Well, when we have a cause, it is always something that happens first. So the cause always happens, what, everyone? First. We have this cause. Then, as a result, we have this, what everyone, this effect. And we have this effect because of the, what everyone, the cause. So we have a cause, then we have a, what everyone, an effect. We have this effect because of the, what everyone, the cause. So my turn first. So, for example, uh, this morning, I was hungry, so 
I had breakfast. I had breakfast because I was, what everyone? Hungry. I was hungry, then I had breakfast. And I had breakfast because I was hungry. Hmm. Ah. It's Halloween. So then the children dressed up in costumes. And they dressed up in costumes because it was Halloween. And uh, it's Halloween, so they dressed up in costumes. They dressed up in costumes because of Halloween. Hmm. Okay. All right, Bob here. Ah. The boys and girls were in third grade. Then they learned how to read. They learned how to read because they were in third grade. So the boys and girls were in what? third grade, then they learned how to read, and they learned to read because they were in third grade. Aha. Uh -huh. So, okay. Oh, I got one. It was Halloween, then they had the Halloween parade. They had the Halloween parade because it was Halloween. Ah, the cause was, it was Halloween, then they had a Halloween parade. And they had that parade because it was Halloween. Okay, so, nice example there of a teacher using explanation again and again, definitely for sure, right? So here is the kind of the graphic that was at the core of the lesson there. So, in terms of what her explanation is, what was the explanation she gave? Well, in fact, she didn't really actually define the effect. She said, we have a cause that happens first. She never actually said what an effect is. Um, but it was implied by all the other things she said, like using then and because and so on. So, how smooth was this? Well, uh, many of the things Dr. Archer does are great, and I think there were some good elements of this, using the words cause and effect and so on. But she used the word then a lot. And then has two meanings. It can mean something causal. It can also mean something sequential, like, you know, things happen in an order. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that one causes the other to occur, right? Um, and so, and it seemed like in some cases, it was like, like hungry, so you ate breakfast. That's, you know, that works. But in some cases, it was like, you know, they, it was Halloween, then they had a parade. Like, yeah, it just like happened, you know, it's, um, I mean, it does have cause, but it just felt like then was not the perfect word. And I thought that that was enhanced, that feeling was enhanced by the fact that she said so, and as a result, in there as well, instead of saying then at certain times, because that actually might have been less awkward sounding. Um, and so my thought here was that um, because was a good word to teach, but instead of then, a different word might have made it less awkward sounding. So it was sort of like this, I like this idea, cause effect loop. Uh, it was like, again and again, same thing, same thing. Um, not a bad thing. Lots of examples there, but I felt like it could have been a little bit clearer. Uh, with all respect to Dr. Archer, whose work that I really love and have shown you lots of examples of, even here, good stuff, but always something we can tweak. And so I share this with you because um, even great instructors can always tweak things a little bit and make them a little less awkward sounding. Um, and, you know, that's okay. Thank you. Okay. I now appear in purple to match the purple box. That's not true, but I am here in purple. Um, so let's take a look at this example. This is another curriculum example that describes a way of teaching um, the vowel constant E pattern. So I want you to read this in your workbook and think to yourself whether or not this explanation meets our criteria for being correct, immediately comprehensible, concrete focused, having the simplest possible vocabulary and syntax, and not being awkward sounding. So read this to yourself. Think about the answers to those questions, and I'll tell you what I think. So go to it. Okay, so let's talk about my thoughts about this. So in terms of the explanation being correct for this uh, secret letter team, the, uh, the vowel consonant E, which we've already seen a lesson on. So is it correct? Yes, it is correct that this is what vowel consonant E is about. Uh, you, have to agree, you have to believe here that the term secret letter team is an okay thing to say. But if you agree that that's an okay thing to say, then this is fine. 
is it comprehensible, concrete, and focused? I think sort of. If we had the visual to go with it, um, it might be easier for us to visualize it. But without it, it does seem a little bit less clear. And it's not really repeated here. It is repeated later in the lesson, but it would have been possible maybe for the authors to make this a little bit clearer uh, by saying the same thing again and again. And this is not a super long part of the lesson, but I think it could have even been uh, more comprehensible to students. Okay, let's talk about the vocabulary is very clear. Um, again, secret theme is something you have to believe is okay. Separated is um, you know, a term the students would have to know. And if you think about the discipline, we've used the term here letter team rather than digraph. Um, and uh, we did that because letter team is pretty common, particularly in early elementary school, and we felt that it was an easy way to describe a whole class of things that include digraphs and diphthongs, and there are differences between things like AAU and AW versus OI, OY. Um, the first two are digraphs, the last two are diphthongs, and we thought that just easier if we avoided that altogether, so we just used the term letter team. We were consistent about that um, throughout the program, and I say we because I actually helped design this program. I actually wrote this, um, but like I wish I'd done it a little bit differently, you know, uh, which is, that's okay. Um, so again, uh, and last, is it not awkward sounding? I think it is an awkward sounding. I think secret letter team is actually kind of cool. Well, I did come up with it, but I actually thought it was kind of an easy way to describe this concept of, you know, something being, um, how to say it, something that, you know, it's a letter team working together, but they're separated, and I thought that was an easy way to explain it, so you could explain, students could understand it again and again uh, in the same way. So I think it's actually pretty good in terms of not being awkward sounding. So I think that one's pretty clear as a curriculum example. Um, not perfectly, though. Could be a little bit better. Okay. Last part of a clear explanation is making it concise. By concise, omit needless words. I mean, omit needless words. Needless word, this, this phrase comes from Strunk and White, a well-known uh, style guide, omit needless words, which is a very pithy way of saying get rid of all the extra stuff. So it's like a lovely example of how to omit needless words is the phrase omit needless words, right? The opposite of what I just said right there. <laughs> Um, so, in terms of being concise, what that means is to only include the details needed for the objective, to make it as short as possible, and eliminate extra stuff that might be interesting but not useful, um, and then also eliminate stuff, and this is an important one, inf anything you could infer, get rid of it. If you could figure, if it's sort of intuitive, there's no other way to do something besides to follow that direction, get rid of it, because that can help you make explanations a lot shorter is if you can get rid of extra information. And I'll show you here how we did that with the, uh, with the explanations that Sarah and I came up with. So if you look here, look for a couple things that you realize, those are super obvious. Like, you don't really need to tell somebody to do those. And you know what the final explanation looks like. So um, you can think about that in those terms. I didn't put it up, though. Uh, it will appear right here. Um, because I want you to sort of have this opportunity to think about what you would uh, get rid of here. So, what do you think? Well, place flat was one. You chop it in half, or you splice it in half, is all we came up with. Um, you cut it in half, or slice, slice it in half, and then what are you going to do with it? You're going to leave it on the wobbly side? No, you're going to flip it over. So it's not necessary to say place flat, probably. Maybe there are other ways to do it. You could probably do it on the side or something. But we felt that it was so easy to infer that we didn't need to include it. So we got rid of place flat. Um, we also got rid of turn 90 degrees. You sliced this direction, and then you're going to chop in the other direction. And you obviously wouldn't chop the same direction that you sliced. So we felt like we didn't need to mention the turning 90 degrees. You would, by, design, by nature, by sort of logic, essentially, do that. Now, it could be for certain people, it's necessary to say the turn 90 degrees, but we eliminated this for our audience was, which was teachers who are learning about explicit instruction, like yourself, um, and we felt it was totally appropriate for adults who are learning this process, and probably for many kids, but there might be cases where you feel like it's important to add in that instruction. So we try to make it more concise in that way. Um, and so we also got rid of chop to other end, because if you're starting to chop, you probably wouldn't start in the, in the middle, you wouldn't stop in the middle, right? So we realized that didn't make sense to add either. And that's how we came up with this, which you can see is considerably shorter than the second one, in some ways longer than the first, but has added into it some ideas that we had not put here that we felt were important. So it actually is, in the end, more concise. So that's that example for you to show you how I've done this in my own life to try to make things more concise. 
Now an activity for you is to think about this yourself and think about how you might do this for in terms of pronunciations, different pronunciations of the letter C. So I'm going to give you uh, examples. I'm going to explain to you how this works here. So the letter C makes two sounds. It makes the k sound and it makes the s sound. And there's sort of a pattern for when C does this. C usually says the k sound when it is followed by A, by E, nope, that's not right, A or O or U, or a consonant, or nothing. So those are the circumstances under which uh, C says k. It says s when it's followed by E or I or Y. And the C, when it's paired up with H, sound, right? But that would be uh, a different uh, situation entirely. So that's the rule for when C says k versus s. And the task for you is to figure out which of, uh, to discuss, think about, decide which of these explanations of this pattern that I've just described to you is adequate for teaching students who are learning it for the first time. So these are all non-ideal, I'll say. Your task is to, one, decide why each is not ideal, and then two, to figure out what would be a better one. What would you write? Okay, so do it. Try it out. Figure out what you think. I'm going to stop the video so I can, um, you know, erase the board and we'll come back together. So enjoy the activity. So let's talk about the answers to these. So let's look at this first one. In circle, C says k as we know, but the other C says s, and that's because the E, I, and Y work the same way. So is this a clear explanation? Well, first of all, it's not really an explanation. It's actually kind of an example that it sort of describes a pattern. I would not say it's clear at all, and I would say it's also way too long to describe, but it's, in the end, not that complicated a concept. C says before E, I, and Y. This one's pretty good. The problem for me is that the word before has a couple of meanings, and I think that it might be ambiguous for students. Thinking about that concrete idea, I'm not sure how comprehensible it is. I'm not sure the vocabulary is quite right. So that before component, I think, might not be ideal. OK. So when C comes before A, O, or U, it says k. When it comes before E, I, and Y, it says s. What do we think about this one? Well, I think it has some unnecessary detail. I think it's actually accurate. It includes a lot of information that is totally precise. So if I were just going for precision, I would go with this. However, we can shorten it because the k sound is sort of the default for C, right? We often think of C saying k. That's the first thing teachers typically teach. So it isn't a problem if we just cut out the first piece and focus on the second piece. So because that's not there, I'd say it has, some, it has too much detail. Let's talk about this next one. Here we have C being a, uh, hold it, hide this for a second. C is a letter switcher. Letter switcher C usually says k, uh, but when it comes before E, I, and Y, it says s. So what do we think about the term letter switcher? I'm going to tell you right away, I do not like it. I made that up, by the way, for the sake of this example. It's not something I've seen in curriculum. Um, it has inappropriate vocabulary. This letter switcher idea is made up. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, I get the idea of it. C says two sounds. But this is adding to students' need for extra language. And when students with intensive needs uh, use language, it's often really difficult for them. They have difficulty processing language information. So adding on them the burden of remembering these are called letter switchers is not a good idea if we can find a simpler way to do things. That's a lot of effort. And it's going to put a strain on working memory. And as we know from the beginning of this module, that demand creates a lot of problems for students. So we don't want to use this definition. Next, C has a hard sound k and a soft sound s, while it says the soft sound s when it comes before e, i, and y. What do we think of this one? Here, this hard and soft terms I don't think are necessary. Lots of people know them. I've never really understood why. I guess k, sort of a plosive sound and s sort of a continuous sound. Not sort of, it is a continuous sound. Um, and so maybe I can see how it's hard and soft. But why mention that? Is it useful to students? Is it going to help them understand the rule of C saying s and k? I think no. 
And I think that the terms while and when add some complex syntax that's going to confuse students. And overall, this is too long. We can make it simpler to begin with. Finally, we'll try for C when it comes before E, I, and Y. What do you think of this one? This one's pretty close. I still think it's awkward sounding. Will try is a weird way to say um, the idea of we're going to do this again. We'll try for C. I, that does not roll off my tongue. You try it. We'll try for C. I mean, I, I can barely say it just thinking about it consciously as I'm doing this. I can't imagine having to teach this for days on end and have students remember this. I also think that try is just too vague a word. Remember, we want to use those concrete terms. And try has a lot of different meanings. And here, trying this, what does it mean to try it? We want to talk about saying things or pronouncing things, and it's better to use that vocabulary. So we need a different way to say it. So here's my definition. After all that change, here's what I came up with. C says when followed by E, I, or Y. What do you think? I think it's pretty good. I mean, I did write it, so probably, of course I did write um, Why? Well, I think that it captures the key ideas. It's the letter C. It says something. That's a verb, a concrete verb. It says, that's easy. C says, that's actually pretty easy to say, almost too easy to say. C says, it's almost, I think I could probably have to slow down on that. When followed by, seems like a little bit of language, but it's going to be clear to students what I'm asking them to do, it, what, what it means. It's when it's followed by these letters. So it's clear that I mean it comes after in sequence, right? Uh, I think that's clearer than saying, as we said up here, before E, I, and Y. It, there's less of a um, time aspect. The following can be in time, but I think a lot of times we think about following as a uh, space kind of thing. Also, I ordered it so that the C comes before the E, I, and Y in the sentence, and I think that makes it easy for students as opposed to switching it and mentioning the E, I, and Y first. So that's what I came up with. Those are my reflections. You may or may not agree. You can tell me what you think. You may not want to talk to yourself about it, so um, you may want to talk to some other folks about it and see what you think. So make some decisions about that, and then we're going to continue on to do something I think is really interesting to help some other folks. So good work. Okay. So we're just about to finish up here with this part of the module where we're going to talk about uh, the clarity of the explanations. Uh, we're going to go to modeling next, but before we do that, we have a very exciting thing to do, which is to write a clear explanation. And I'm, I'm smiling big because I'm so excited about this for you. You know some folks who have cell phones, smartphones. And some of those folks uh, are not young folks. And some of those folks started using telephones when they were dial telephones. And you know, like hopefully most of you teachers know about the dial telephones, but quickly the whole population of teachers are going to have no idea what I mean by Dial, you know, telephone, sort of literally putting your finger in these holes and moving it around. It's a very strange way to make a phone call. So the idea of a smartphone is a really hard one. And, but they've heard of text messaging maybe and want to send text messages. My mother and her sisters send way too many text messages to each other. Um, but, and they know how to do it. But my grandmother doesn't. And she's really struggled with it. I saw her phone one time and she's, it's like her text messages are a litter of like, you know, half typed names and phone numbers and she doesn't understand how to do it. And so the task here is to come up with an explanation for how an older person would learn to write a text message for the given uh, smartphone that you have. If you don't have a smartphone, you're gonna have to sort of like look online for example of them. I'm guessing that most of you who are doing this module will have some kind of smartphone. If it's like not that smart, you could just use an example from your own phone, um, assuming that older person had one like yours. So the goal is to come up with this explanation. And then after you come up with it, think about the, uh, do that in the way that I described to you. Come up with, you know, your clear explanation, uh, show it to someone, think it through, revise it, use different vocabulary, make sure it's not awkward sounding. And after you've done all that, write it again and see if you can make it better. And then this is a discussion board activity because we want you to actually share both and talk about how the ones that you came up with aligned with a checklist and the ones other people came up with, how theirs aligned with the checklist. It's a really cool opportunity for you to apply this idea of a clear explanation uh, using all the criteria here and to do it in a way that's going to really support 
um, someone real, hopefully. Um, you can actually help your you know, older folks to do this well. Um, and here are the guidelines for using the discussion board. We just want to emphasize here that this is a great opportunity for conversation. So you don't need to just write your post and leave it there. Dialogue with folks. Write short responses and say why. But don't focus on, that's good, I like this. Focus on, this meets the criteria, and so on. Um, and so I just want to emphasize that as well. So, uh, so, that's the, so that's the goal for this discussion board. So once you've done that and you've had some discussions, you can look at the uh, review of this I have online to tell you sort of how I thought about it. So enjoy the discussion board on this. I think it'll be a really interesting opportunity for you to talk with others about this. And after you've had some nice discussions, you can read mine. In fact, you can even talk about mine on the discussion board. So, uh, so good luck with that discussion board. Make sure you do that by the end of the module. And uh, you can come back and watch the video of me uh, explaining how I came up with mine. So, Enjoy the discussion board. Okay, so you've had some cool discussions online. Maybe you even discussed this online if some of you read it, looked at it already. But here, the, the, this is what I came up with. So I did it the first time, and at first I sort of had to just go through it. Like I had to actually figure out all the steps you would need, starting the home screen, how you would get to type an entire text message. I have an iPhone for this purpose, OK? Um, and so here are the steps that I came up with doing that. Uh, and it was, it was OK. Um, but you, there's a lot of language here. And so when I redid it, I tried to make it simpler. I couldn't change the number of steps because you really needed all of these things. This is what's called a task analysis because you literally need every single thing. We need every little bite-sized chunk here in order to do the skill. And with my second one, you really need to make sure that um, the people would understand the words tap and type and how those actually work. So I find sometimes people tap for too long or tap with the whole finger and it doesn't work. Um, and so, uh, so that's one thing. And then also, if this were not just being written like this, it would be great to have icons to go with it. I was just describing the language. That's what we're talking about here. But you could imagine that being helpful as well. So you can see that I think that the first one, in terms of the rubric, is sort of comprehensible. You kind of get what's going on there. So in, everything is described in detail. It has good vocabulary and syntax. Is it awkward sounding? No, but like things like gently tap the speech bubble one time are a little bit sort of clunky, I think. Tap the numbers to type the, tap the numbers to type the number. That's awkward sounding. So, I'm not sure if it meets that criteria, probably not. Does it have only the details needed? In general, yeah, as I said, like you couldn't get rid of anything. You needed all of these, so it's probably at the right level. Is it as short as it could be? No, and that's where I fixed the second one. So if I look at my second version of that, is it comprehensible? Yes, you can figure out what to do. It's just as comprehensible as the top one. Does it have simple vocabulary? Yes, just as much as the top one, and I've eliminated a lot of other uh, terms and so on that would make it a little bit simpler. Um, and then it's definitely not awkward sounding. I get rid of type, tap the numbers to type the number. That was one thing that changed a lot of it. I just realized that was a real problem. Um, and it only has the details you would need. It's not, so it's not awkward sounding. It only has the details you would need, and it's as short as I could possibly make it, I think. Maybe you did better, but that's what I could do. So that's the conclusion of that piece. And I hope that you were able to um, use this to uh, help someone. So good job to you if you actually worked with somebody to do this. The last piece of this part of the module on clear explanations is about using the explanation consistently. It's pretty simple to describe this. It means repeating the explanation until students can use it, using the exact same words or similar words. You've already heard me talk about that in terms of the word metaphor. Um, so that's something you've already seen um, there. Now I'm going to talk about it uh, more, with a more um, uh, with a procedure as opposed to a declarative piece of knowledge. Now we're going to have an opportunity to look at an example of a teacher using an explanation consistently, or you get to decide if the teacher is using it consistently. In this example, Mr. Shu, who's here on the left, is teaching Christian here on the right. Oh, excuse me, he's on the right. He's on the left, um, teaching him to match shapes. This is actually a new skill for this student who's a middle school student who's learning some basic concepts about shapes. So he recently learned the identities of the shapes, and this is a continuation of that lesson. These are the steps that Mr. Shu put on the chart that you'll see him post on the whiteboard. 
And the question for you is how many times does he repeat that third step of drawing that line to connect the shapes during the lesson? And I also want you to reflect on whether it was necessary for him to repeat it so consistently so many times. To do this, we're going to ask you to fill out this chart. This chart gives you an opportunity to figure out exactly where these things happen. When you fill out a chart using this kind of procedure of time stamping things, it really allows you to pinpoint exactly when things are happening. It's a good practice for your own practice to look at things and stamp them when they happen. Uh, you don't literally have to stamp things, but like you get the idea of like time stamping, like remember when it occurred, so you can go back and look at it for different practices. So here, that's what we want you to do. So you can see here from t minutes, tw uh, seconds 28 to 32, um, Mr. Shu gave an explanation by reading from the checklist as he gives the explanation. So your task is going to be to write the time stamps, what phase of his instruction is occurring, whether or not it's a clear explanation or the modeling multiple examples, and description of what's actually occurring. I'm going to have you watch the video in a second. I just want to be clear that um, there's a beeping sound that occurs every minute, and that's because of this timer that's designed to sort of keep track of uh, when things are occurring. So I apologize in advance for the beeping sound, but you'll be able to hear Shin pretty clearly. So if you're wearing headphones, turn them down just a little bit every minute or so. All right, so let's watch the video. This uh, we can also divide it into three steps. Step by step here. So. In order to match the shape, first we can identify the shape, and then second, identify the shape, uh, it's a triangle, and then find the same shape from the, the groups of uh, shapes. So we find here is the triangle, and the third and the last step, we draw a line to connect them. Draw a line from here. Now let's practice. Here, we will work on this packet today. So what do you need to do now? Uh, for on this packet, it has some words on the top. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is draw a line to match the shapes, right? I will show you first. Uh, look at it carefully. And then we can work together. The first item I will show you, see? Uh, the first step, identify the shape. So what's this shape? Triangle. Three steps use the maker triangle. And the second step, we need to find the same shape from another group, right? This group. So, can I uh, Is this a triangle? No. No, it's not a triangle, it's a square. Is this a triangle? Yes. Yes, great. That's the triangle. So, three steps and the same. So, both of them are triangle, find, oh, we find two triangles. So, then the the last step is to draw a line to connect them. So draw a line to connect them. Right? That's how say what we need to do to draw a line to match the shapes. So yeah. okay, one more. So what's this shape? A circle. A circle, yes, that's three steps. So we need to find another circle, right? On the right. So is this a circle? No, we, we have a it's not a circle, it's a square. Yeah. This is uh, a triangle. not square. This is a rectangle, right? Also not square. This is a star, star not square. Uh, no, 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 not circle, sorry. Is this? Yes. Yes, that's the circle. Yes. So, three steps. And then what's the last step? We have already put, both of them are circles. They are the same. So yes. what do we need to do next? After we already found two circles, the same shape, the last step is to draw a line to reconnect. Yeah, so what we need to do is draw a line, right? To connect. Yes, right. So now it's your turn. It's your turn. We have one bigger. Let's work it together on the, on the third item. So, what's this shape? A square. Square, yes, that's true stuff. Great. And then we need to find another square on there. Alright, so can you find the square on the right? Yes, great. Great. And then the 
After we have already found the two squares that belong to the same shape, what do you need to do? Draw a line. Draw a line to connect them. Match them, right? So both of them are square, right? Yes. So, okay, fantastic. Okay, so let's talk about Mr. Shin's video. So, how did your time stamping go? If you haven't finished that yet, before you continue on, it's important to finish this so that you have an opportunity to compare what I'm about to show you to what you actually did. You don't have to, but I think it's important to get in the habit of doing that as a good practice for you when you're recording your instructions, as I already said. So here's what I came up with. Here's the time stamping for this video. You can see here that Mr. Shu uses this uh, pro procedure seven times within that uh, very short video. Remember that another question we had here was whether or not uh, Mr. Shu was uh, needed to do this. So, uh, so the, whether you need to repeat it this many times. What's your answer? I have an answer, as you can imagine. My answer is that he does. He needs it because you could see in the middle that when he asked him, when he prompted him for the first time, he didn't know. He paused, he thought, he wasn't sure. And Mr. Xu referred him to the checklist, right? So he would remember what to do. Um, and that's critical because now he is moving the student toward independence by doing it in this way. So that's a great example of when those multiple repetitions, using the language consistently and many times, is resulting in the student at the end being able to state the step on his own. And how cool is that? We're trying to get exactly that point. It's a beautiful example of how to use an explanation consistently. So good job, Mr. Shu. Good job, Christian. Now let's talk about modeling examples based on the clear explanation. I want to begin with a question we might ask, though, which is, is this really important? Probably my answer is yes. But I want to confront that just a little bit because I've talked with people where they think that like we don't need to model that much. I've worked with students who didn't in their lesson include a model at all on the basis that they thought they could go directly from the explanation to the practice. And some of you may have that thought from time to time, yeah, do we really need to model everything? It's a good question. So I want to confront that. Couldn't we sometimes just give an explanation? I'm asking, sorry, I should have clarified. I paused for a second to sort of get you to think about that. Are there cases where it might be appropriate not to do that? Well, let's do an example. Let's use an example and talk about what could happen if we just use an explanation. I'm going to do it with uh, an objective that some of you may already have mastered, but many of you probably have not, which is uh, being able to tie a tie using a necktie using a simple knot, simple knot just like this. This is the most simple knot of all in terms of necktie tying. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. This is a really simple one. So let me give you the explanation for how to do it. The first part is to drape the tie around your neck with the seam side hidden. Cross the ends with the narrow end behind the wide one. Make sure the wide end hangs longer. Then loop the wide end around the back of the narrow end. Keep looping the wide end so it crosses the front and goes to the back again. Pull the wide end up through the back, then slide the wide end between the front part of the loop and the short end of the tie. Pull it down to finish the knot. Okay, so that's my explanation. I want you to think to yourself, what was effective about it? And, and then think about whether or not you'd be ready to practice after this explanation. So this is an activity you do in your workbook. So go ahead and, in your workbook, write about your answers to those questions. And I'll wait here for you. And I'll come back and I'll tell you what I think. OK, so I've been waiting uh, here in space um, to talk about this. So what was effective about the explanation? I'm going to tell you some of the thoughts I had. I think the language was relatively clear. I don't know how to explain the idea of looping the wide end around the back of the narrow end any better than I did right there thought of the, about this. I worked on my clear explanation. That was the best I could come up with. I thought it worked OK. The graphics also help visualize the process as part of the explanation. So that was a nice uh, addition to that as well. And then I want to think about whether I'd be able to practice after this. And my answer is no. The thing is that the terms aren't described. 
and the movements are too subtle and nebulous to be able to describe this way. So here we see the word seam side, and it says cross the ends. Cross the ends can mean a lot of things. You could cross them down here. You know, like what does it mean to cross the ends? The picture does help, but it might not be enough for me to do it just based on that description. And the images aren't really helpful, like this line down here, like what's that about? Literally, all you have to do is cross them there. It's not like you have to like push it down to the bottom of the page or something, or to the bottom of the shirt or something like that. So there are ways in which that explanation isn't going to be adequate. Even though it was very clear, it wasn't going to be enough. So that was the clearest explanation I could come up with. And for some skills, that might be all. So sometimes a clear explanation is not enough to get students all the way there. What models do is improve students' understanding of the explanation by clarifying some things and eliminating ambiguity that uh, might be in the students' minds when they're trying to do this for the first time. It also reduces the cognitive load on students as they learn something new by allowing them to see you engage in the process and not push them immediately to try to do it on their own. That is the reason we did lots of models of clear explanations before we had you go off and help someone with their cell phone. We wanted to think about ways to help you do that better. We modeled it a lot before we asked you to practice. So that's the rationale for models. I'll add here, although it's not on the slide, that there are times where you might be able to go immediately to practice after a clear explanation. And sometimes the model is very, very short. And that's OK. But I think in many cases, if it's a more involved procedure or if it's a longer uh, it's a not peak kernel of knowledge that requires more detail, it's going to be unlikely that just with um, one quick explanation, students will always understand. But it certainly isn't impossible if it's a really short explanation or procedure. So let's, though, talk now about the elements of modeling. There are three pieces to create an effective model. Um, show the steps or provide unique examples, verbalize the thinking, and have students observe. So let's start with showing all the steps or providing unique examples. So when we say showing all the steps, for a procedure, this means addressing everything that's in the clear explanation. And that goes all the way back to what? So we, the clear explanation relates back to the learning outcome, right. So it goes all the way back to the objective and the learning outcome you've established for the lesson. So it must be all the way a link back to that. Um, th those are sometimes called worked examples. You have to see that language uh, in other texts. You saw that language in uh, the Martin article. Um, so they're often called worked examples and they're ways to, uh, that's a sort of term for modeling uh, individual examples of something using, when you're using a procedure. Often, it will also include a template or an organizer to help students do this better. Um, those are evidence-based practices to give students an organizer for certain skills as they're learning them. If it's not a procedure, if it's a piece of knowledge, then you want to provide unique examples of the knowledge to enhance student understanding of it. It's a complex idea. It can be really helpful to do that. Let me give you examples of these two things. So here's a strategy, the best strategy by O'Connor and colleagues to uh, have students break a word, a long polysyllabic word, into parts, and then to put those together to say a word. This um, could be explained. This is the explanation that could be used with worked examples. And so what's recommended by O'Connor and colleagues is to model multiple times the use of this strategy. In the case of a word, this case is about uh, the word interfere, interference. And this, is a, this includes a number of examples of the definition of interfere. This is not the explanation. The explanation is what interfere means. These are examples that I would give as the instructor to explain further what I meant by interfere, or interfering, or interference, or interfered. Um, and I would teach students that those are all related words. Um, and I might even use the best strategy to have students practice them before we did this part of the lesson. But the key here is that I'm elaborating on it by giving multiple unique examples as a model. So let's talk about this piece about showing all the steps for procedures. So you remember the video of me and Sarah and her teaching me the onion. You've now seen uh, the intro to that and you've had a chance to watch the whole video if you wanted to. Um, but what I want to look at now is how Sarah models. How does she actually model the steps and how does she make sure that I remember them when it's going to be time to go to practice? So let's watch Sarah teach me about how to uh, do the model. Or teach me how to cut an onion using a model. So let's go ahead and watch that. 
enjoy. And I'll stand here so you can see me looking at me and Sarah. <laughs> it's just kind of an interesting, interesting thing to do. Okay, let's watch. Okay, so now you've seen example of modeling from Sarah. So let's talk about the, what actually happened here. So does she model all the steps? Yes, yeah, she absolutely does. How does she make sure I remember them? She refers to checklists as she goes. She uses that same language on the checklist consistently, and she has me participate, but in a limited way. Did I do any of the work? No, I did none of the work. I, though, did get to participate. How did Sarah let me participate? She allowed me to point at things. She allowed me to repeat things that she was saying um, and made it sort of fun. And I would occasionally add in a comment and she would stay on task but sort of respond to that in a fun way. So she made sure that I was focused on the steps and she used language to help me, she had prompts to help me participate. So that's a good example of someone showing all the steps in the procedure. Also a good example of, in a model, not having the student do any of the work, okay? Let's turn now to an example of um, providing unique examples of a vocabulary word. So I want you to look here at the, my, def, my explanation of the word disembark. And I want you to be able to separate what's an explanation from what's a model here. Um, and I want you to think then, how could I even enhance my, uh, my model by including additional or changing my unique examples? So go ahead and watch this video of me teaching uh, about the word disembark, and then we'll talk about whether or not it's a good model. The second word is disembark. What's the word? Disembark. Disembark means to get off. What does it mean? Get off. And it means to get off like a boat. Like in this example, these are shoulders, and they are, what are they doing? They are getting off or disembarking. What are they doing? Disembarking. They're disembarking. Here's another example of people um, getting off of a ferry. So they are what? 
they're disembarking from the ferry. That's right. In the text today, um, the girl and her family go to visit the Ellis Island Museum. They have to take a ferry to get there. When they arrive on Ellis Island, what do they do? They disembark from there. OK, good. OK, so now you've seen an example of me teaching the word disembark. So in terms of the explanation, my explanation was just the definition. So that's my explanation. And then the model was all the examples that I gave. So I gave multiple examples. I had pictures to illustrate the examples, all of which were helpful for students to get that. So the model is not very long, but it is still a model because I am giving students the examples. They aren't participating in making any decisions about the models. I am giving them, and then I'm elaborating on them so students understand why it's an example of that. right? So how could I, though, enhance this? One thing I could have done would be to vary the examples to include different vehicles. You can disembark from a train or a plane and so on. Actually, I actually had to look that up. I wasn't sure if there were other examples. Um, I could also then have used non-examples, like getting out of a car isn't disembarking. Um, usually, I don't think we think of it that way. And this not use of non-examples would have been helpful because one thing that often happens to students is they misunderstand a definition um, by like, you know, get off of a car or get out of a car. They might think that like, if, you know, you get off a deck or something, maybe that's also an example of disembark because they just got the idea of, you know, like get off of something. Um, they didn't understand that it had to be a vehicle. And so, uh, so that's one way in which I could have probably added to this lesson. But otherwise, it's a decent model, an example of how to, for a concept or for a kernel of knowledge, you could model really well. So you've now seen examples of um, how to either provide unique examples or to show all the steps, which are the first, the first thing to do. The next thing to do is to verbalize your thinking. The idea here is to do often something called a think aloud. The idea of a think aloud is for you to make transparent to the students what is it you are trying to get them to understand. What are you thinking as you complete the steps? The checklist is there, but you're going to elaborate on it. So one good example of that with Sarah was, what's one thing that she taught me about that wasn't on her checklist? It's something about the use of the knife. What it was it? Do you remember? It might be worth clicking back uh, on the video to see if you can remember what it was she talked to me about, what she did in terms of the knife. And if you can't remember, I'm sort of illustrating it here, that was the claw. The idea you hold it like this, you don't, you know, slice through your fingers if you, you know, cut, you can cut, you cut your knuckles rather than cutting, you know, middle of your finger. It's gross for me to even talk about. But that idea is important that basically what she did was to add to the checklist in ways that um, were important but didn't distract from the lesson. They actually elaborate on it. They enhanced the use of the checklist. The claw wasn't necessarily, necessarily, wasn't necessarily necessary to put into the checklist itself but it was useful to add to that. So verbalizing the thinking is an important part of that. If it's for some kernel of knowledge, the idea is here you can explain how an example matches what you already taught. So I gave examples of, you know, different examples of di disembarking. Um, and for all of those examples, I, uh, you know, I gave an explanation for why that was an example of disembarking. You know, these people are getting off the ship. They're getting off. Soldiers getting off the ship. These people are disembarking from the ship or the ferry to get to the museum, and so on. If I'd done non-examples, it would have been the same thing. It's important to note this word is in italics for a reason, which is they aren't doing it yet. The model is not them participating. Okay, this is why I wanted to go back to that idea of the necktie. I did that because I think it's easy for people to think. Aren't we ready to practice? And the answer is no. Even if it's guided practice that you're going to, it's not OK, because you need to show students the verbalization of the thinking. And if you get them right into doing the work, that's not going to lead to them really understanding it. So they're not doing the work. But are they doing anything? So you think about Sarah. I already told you I did some stuff. What about in the video of me with the students? Did they do anything? Yeah, they did. They responded to me as I was going through the, uh, through the model. So they had opportunities to respond. They just didn't have to do anything that required them to actually do any of the work yet. And that's what makes it a model. I verbalized my thinking. I didn't require students to do the work. 
So let's look at a curriculum example. Um, and this is an example of how you might teach students to break words into parts, similar to the best strategy that I described before. It's not the same. The objective here is to students who identify words are broken into parts that each have a vowel. And what I want you to look at here is how the program has the teacher um, verbalize their thinking about this. So if you look at this, um, if you look at this, you can see. Uh, so I'll give you. If you want to read it to yourself, it's in the it's in your workbook, and uh, I'm not going to read it to you. But you can see here there are examples of where the teacher verbalizes the thinking. So the teacher says, "Does this part have a vowel?" Now the teacher is um, going is asking students a question here. Does it have a vowel? But that's not the skill. They know there's a vowel. The blank means the student responded. So I say, this part has a vowel, so it follows the rule. So I'm verbalizing the idea that it has a vowel, so it follows a rule. So that's an example of how to verbalize something. And so these are uh, multiple examples. Also here, same thing. The teacher is doing the work. All the student is doing is filling in whether or not the part has a vowel. And even here again, the teacher is doing all of the things. You can see those blanks are all opportunities students have to participate, but the teacher is verbalizing their thinking about when, how to break up the word, whether it has a vowel in it. That's an example of how a curricula, a curriculum in this case, does a pretty good job of verbalizing the thinking. Finally, let's talk about having students observe. I've spoken to this already, but it's imp so important. I said about it before, and I'm re-saying re it, restating it now. You want students to watch. You want them to watch carefully, and you want to use supporting practices to keep students engaged and cognitively processing the content. I bolded that for a reason. That's a term or a phrase we're going to come back to when we talk about um, supporting practices in the next parts of the next modules. Cognitively processing the content is about keeping our heads in the game, keeping us processing, keeping us um, understanding what's going on. That's what engagement is about. It's about maintaining our ability to take in the information and ultimately learn something. Um, and so supporting practices are designed to help student, to help do that. There are things like eliciting responses, where you find ways to involve the students as often as possible. And that's what you want to do here. So when you model, very important to elicit responses related to the content you just taught. What I mean is, by content you just taught, you're not going to have students um, answer any questions that you haven't already answered yourself. But if you just taught it, you can have students basically say again, restate what you've already said. And you might think, isn't that just parroting? I would say no, because what it's doing is giving the students another opportunity to repeat the same thing you said. Now, are they repeating in the same way that a parrot would? Technically, yes. But unlike a parrot that isn't thinking about it, students through this process are getting more many more opportunities to, uh, to reuse the language. And, uh, and it'll keep them focused by even just having them reuse the language. So do that. Don't have the students say or do anything that expects them to have an answer you haven't given. If they have not heard you explain it first, they should not be figuring it out. The goal is not to ask students to guess. One of the, I'll mention this when we talk about um, the later modules on, uh, on eliciting responses, but one of the things that drives me crazy in a lesson in, on vocabulary is when the teacher's first thing is to ask the students, what do you think this word means? And I think to myself, why are you asking that? You just designed a lesson. And why did you design the lesson on this vocabulary word? Like, think about it, everyone at home. Like, why did you design the lesson on a vocabulary word? because you thought the student didn't know it. So if the student doesn't know it, then wouldn't you, um, wouldn't you teach, you, I'm not saying this the right way. If, you, if, the student, if the student already knew it, why would you teach the lesson? So why ask them, do you know what this means? Because you've already decided they don't know, because that's why you're teaching the lesson. And if you think they know, then you probably should have decided already not to do it or ask them beforehand, before you design the lesson on this topic. So don't ask students to give you answers that you haven't already given, OK? And don't ask students to guess at things like this. What do you know about Ellis Island? That could have been something I could have said before I gave a clear explanation of the definition of one of my words um, to get students involved in that. So if I was actually even defining Ellis Island or describing Ellis Island, which my objective was to describe the uh, characteristics of Ellis Island as a knowledge objective, 
Um, if I ask this question, I'm going to get a lot of stuff. And the problem is what? Students might not know things. How many students have been to Ellis Island? I don't know, right? If I'm teaching a lesson to students, maybe I don't know if they've gone to New York and been able to see all of that. So that is, uh, that is really important that they might not know a lot. The other ones might not know things that aren't true about uh, Ellis Island, and so it's important not to do that. So here's an example of me in that same lesson you saw before about Ellis Island, like sort of threading the needle there. So look, watch how I um, involve students, but don't make it a situation in which they're guessing. So take a look. Um, so this says Ellis Island. What does it say? One more time. What does it say? Ellis Island. Ellis Island. So have you heard of Ellis Island before? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Ellis Island is the place in the United States where a lot of times people would come when they came to this country for the first time. What did I do? I asked them if they'd heard of it. I had them raise their hands. I acknowledged it and moved on. And then I described it myself. I gave, I, then I modeled myself the explanation of that. So I got around that by acknowledging students if they had some prior knowledge about it and then did the explanation myself and did the model myself. So that is a good example of how to get around this thing of trying to engage students um, but not getting wrong information out there. So I want you to watch in some of your lessons and so on, uh, in some of the videos we're going to watch, to see whether or not teachers are asking those kinds of questions. So now let's look at an example of um, one of our teachers here at UConn um, who's getting her PhD, took the next step to get a PhD. Uh, her name is uh, Katie Leonard, and Ms. Leonard is teaching here uh, about the A constant E pattern. The vowel constant E just keeps on coming back in this, in this module. And I want you to compare and contrast the two examples. There are two of them here. And then I want you to think about whether or not her models align with the checklist that we've designed based on what we've seen in this model, module. So go ahead and watch this first example of her teaching about the uh, vowel consonant E. We just learned that the sound spelling A consonant E makes the long A sound, just like we hear in cake. Now we're going to practice reading words with the sound spelling A consonant E. Step one, we're going to identify the pattern. And step two, we're going to read the word. I'll show you how to read the first three words. Identify the pattern, A. Read the word, cake. A, tape. A, save. Now it's your turn to practice reading the words. That's the first example. And it says guided practice, but in fact, it's actually um, modeling. So that was the first model. Let's look at a second model. We just learned that the magic E can make the A say the long sound, just like we hear in cake. Let's practice reading some words. Who can read the first word for me? Okay, let's compare and contrast. Okay, so in the first example, there were, stu do there were only two steps, but she modeled both of them. She reviewed them first, she gave the clear explanation, she explained how she did it, she didn't make the students do anything. In the second one, there was a simple explanation, there wasn't really a procedure for the students to follow, there was no thinking to verbalize, and she asked them to do it right away. That's not modeling. So these are two very good examples of how you can and cannot do modeling well with the same content. So now let's flip over to looking at a real lesson. So this is a teacher. Um, this is Ms. L. In Ms. L's example, she is having students use knowledge of sound spellings to chain words by changing one sound spelling at a time. The key question for you to answer here is, does her model meet the criteria for effective modeling? So this is an activity for you to do in your workbook. So analyze this example, and then I'll tell you my thoughts about it. So let's watch the example now. We're going to spell some words that are made up of sounds that we've already learned. And you're going to use your sound box and your letters to do that. So when we're working, first we're going to say the word. 
Then we're going to stretch the word holding up one finger for each sound. Then we're going to move the letters into the sound boxes for each sound. We'll touch each letter and then we'll read the word. Some of the words will only have three sounds, so we'll just leave the last one blank. Okay? So watch my example and listen. The first word I'm going to do is dug. The excavator dug a hole at the construction site. So first I'm going to say it, dug. Then I'm going to do it with my fingers, dug. Then I'm going to move it, you just watch, dug. I'll touch the letters as I make the sounds, dug. And then when I read the whole word, I'll do my finger under it, dug. Okay, there's the first example. And this is the first part of two parts. We're going to watch two videos. So look at the uh, video. Uh, the, look at that. Does it meet the criteria for effective modeling? She shows all the steps. And in fact, she does a good job explaining the steps without even doing a model of them before she starts the model. Then she does show all the steps when she actually does her model. She verbalizes what she's doing. There's nothing deeper for students to figure out. Everything is clear. She describes her process. She adds in words to think aloud about what she's doing. And then she only has students observe. In fact, she is super clear about that. She actually says, just me, not you, right? She actually specifically states they're not to participate in a specific way. They do participate a little bit. They sort of chime in with the sound, and she doesn't stop them, which is great. She's keeping them uh, with her and keeping them engaged. She also teaches a nice calm manner, which helps as well. Point, though, is she has students only observe. They're not doing the work. OK, so let's look at a second video as part of this analysis. In this case, the students are stating the main idea of a picture using the GIST strategy, which you've already seen before in this module. Uh, the teacher doesn't do it within a GIST framework, but that's, and she doesn't even call it that, but that's what she's doing here. Um, and so the question is, again, does this model meet the effective modeling criteria? So let's watch. So when we are going to find out the main idea of a picture or a story, we can follow three steps. I've written them up on our chart. First step to determining the main idea is to identify the most important who or what in that photo or story. Who or what is it mostly about? Step number two is to identify the most important information about the who or what. So we found who or what the story or photo is mostly about. Now we need to know the information about that who or what. And step number three is to write or say that information in one short sentence. We're going to try and say it in 10 words or less. So we're going to practice today using a photo. So I want us to look at step number one. Step number one is to identify the most important who or what in this photo. Come on your knee. I think you found the most important who or what in this photo. Owen? The girl in the white dress. Why do you think the girl in the white dress is the most important who or what? Because she's the only one that's wearing the white dress. Step number two is to identify the most important information about the who or what. Let me give you some think time. So we said the most important who or what is the girl in the white dress. I'm on your knee if you'd like to share the most important information about the who or what. Aiden? Mm, the most important thing about the who and what is the girl in the white dress getting married. Who thinks they can help us? Right now we're going to say this information in one short sentence using ten words or less. That's step number three. Rachel? The girl in the white dress is getting married. The girl in the white dress is getting married. Go ahead and put a thumb on your head if you agree. Okay, so there's an example of that teaching that strategy. So how about the model? Well, let's start by describing the explanation. She does give the explanation. She reads it right from the chart. So it's very clear. Um, then, when she goes to model, does she show all of the steps? She states the steps, but she doesn't show students how to do them herself. And that mattered her here because the first answer that she got 
about the most important who or what and the explanation for that was not exactly what I think she was going for. She was hoping the student would talk about the person being a bride. The student totally appropriately said is the only person in a white dress. And so um, if the teacher had been modeling that, she could have described the process she might go through of thinking about um, which of the people is most important and maybe for a, you know, maybe, oh, that's a white dress, but also there, it's a wedding and the bride is most important at the wedding. So that's the reason. So uh, in addition to it being a white dress. So that was something a teacher could have done. And the fact the student gave an answer wasn't quite what the teacher was looking for explained why that was a challenge. The other thing I noticed was that for the second step, when students are supposed to say the most important information, there was much more to say about the picture, but the students didn't say anything else about the picture. Why? Because the teacher had a model that they only taught, they only did one thing. So here there isn't actually a model, which is a problem. And because she doesn't verbalize her thinking, because she doesn't actually do any thinking herself, that becomes a challenge for the students trying to do it. And then she actually has the students do the work. She has the students give the answers. And what you notice there is that with the third answer, both the second and third answer, they're essentially the exact same thing because the teacher hadn't shown the students how those things are distinct. And if she'd verbalized her thinking and had students observe, that wouldn't have happened. So the teacher is doing a great activity, a good strategy, and she's obviously very organized and on top of uh, making sure students know the procedure. But without the model, it's not clear students are actually going to get it. And I think from the example we saw there, maybe they didn't quite get it. So that gives us a sense of how to actually execute the models. Finally, let's talk about supporting practices. You have a whole upcoming two modules on uh, how to do supporting practices. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about those. But I do want to review them for you and to make clear that the reason that this gray box of supporting practices goes underneath both modeling and practice is that throughout both modeling and practice, what are you doing? You are, yes, using supporting practices. So I'm just going to briefly describe for you what supporting practices are about. First, supporting practices are designed to maximize cognitive processing of the lesson content. Again, this meant, I do, mentioned this idea before of engagement being about cognitive processing of the lesson content. We want to get students heads in the game, thinking about the ideas. And so when we model, we want to make sure that students are actively engaged in the model. So one way to do that is to have students participate by core responding, by whispering to a partner, and other things that we'll talk about in the part of the module on eliciting responses. But having them do things where they're having opportunities to repeat what you did, but you're not asking them to do any of the work. You don't even want them to be thinking about it and whispering to a partner what their answer is. Don't do that. You want them just to be themselves um, thinking about what you've just said, not having to do any of the other work. Okay? Providing feedback, you want to affirm correct responses, and there should be a lot of them because you're having the students do very little of the work. You want to correct misunderstandings when students aren't actually able to repeat the things you've already told them. To be clear, should there be misunderstandings because students were doing the task uh, themselves? No, because students should not be doing the task themselves. They are only observing, not performing the task. They are, so their misunderstandings just might be about the directions or might be about an element of the knowledge that they didn't fully understand. Maintaining a brisk pace is really important, and I'll say more about this in that, part, in that module that contains that. The idea of brisk pace is to model quickly, but equally important is to know when students are ready for the next step and not sort of belaboring or going on too long about doing a model. I said that we start by interrogating the idea that modeling was important or not important. And we said that modeling is important, but we don't need to model forever. We want to decide whether, when it's enough modeling to go on. That said, I will tell you that when I observe lessons, I much more frequently see not enough modeling rather than too much modeling. So the whole idea of models is to have multiple models. And if you only have one, probably students aren't going to be ready to practice. In some cases, if it's very simple, they might be. But many, many times I find that if it's a multi-step procedure or complex knowledge, that modeling more than once or giving more than one example is really critical to student understanding. So brisk pace does not mean just one model. Brisk pace means moving on when students are ready. Okay, 
Now that we have all those pieces put together, we're going to do an activity called I'll Start It. We're going to look at a curriculum example from a real program, and this is one that um, is, about, is designed for younger children in reading. Um, and the objective here is to, as given by the program, understand relationships between letters and sounds. It's a pretty vague objective. Okay? And here's the lesson as described by the uh, authors of the program. This is literally what's written in the book with this objective as well. And what we want to think about is in terms of the, uh, our checklist, how does this do in terms of the checklist? So take a minute to read it to yourself. I'm not going to read it to you, so you probably want to pause the video and read it in your workbook. Um, and I'm just going to briefly start by talking about um, the query explanation match the learning outcome. So let's just talk about that now that presumably you've read it. I'll pause for you to pause the video if you haven't had a, you didn't know where to, where to get a chance because I didn't give you a word in edgewise or whatever. All right, that was me freezing so you could pause the video. I hope that worked. Um, so the objective is, is to understand relations between letters and sounds, which is vague anyway. But the question is, where does the explanation go that matches the lesson outcome? Well. The lesson outcome is not really specifically related to this objective because there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's not actually clear what the activities are all designed for. If the focus is on relations with letters and sound, much of this is not really relevant. The really key piece is somewhere down here about the connection between the letter and the sound. There's a lot of stuff at the beginning um, that's more focused on the sounds of the words rather than the letters. So if I'm going to take this lesson and change it, I'll start it. So I've changed first the objective. So students will identify spoken words that begin with the d sound and associate them with the letter d. Because that's what, that's my interpretation of this sort of unclear objective of understanding relations between letters and sounds. And it's about d. So I'm assuming that that's what this um, lesson is designed to focus on. So one thing you're going to have to do in programs sometimes is figure out what they are trying to do, right? Um, and so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to start this way. So this is my part of the work. And so I'm going to show you what I came up with. I'm starting it. We already know this letter. What letter? D. We also know the sound of D. What is it? D. We're going to listen for the first, to the first sound of words and, and do what? So you've got to finish the explanation. Then the model. My turn first. Hold a picture of a dog. This says dog. What does it say? Dog. Then I say, now I, now you need to describe how you would do the model. And then come up with two more cycles of modeling that you would do based on the first model, okay, in order to prepare students for practice. So your task is to finish the explanation and to finish the model and then write two more models all by yourself. So good luck with that. We're letting you off into the environment. We are, we've given you lots of opportunities to practice and think about things, the little pieces, and now we're putting it all together. This is the scary part. So good luck doing your best to try to figure that out. We'll come back together then, and, and when you're finished, you can look at the review of what I thought. So you do it. You finish it. OK, so now that you've finished it, I'm going to show you sort of the idea that I based on what we described. So instead of sort of um, reading all of this to you, uh, since you've seen most of it, I'll just say here that um, listen to the first sound of the word. If it makes the d sound, hold up your d, your d card. If not, don't hold up your card. So the students know exactly what to do. I've given them the procedure to follow. They're listening for the sound of the word. They make the sound, hold up the d card. If not, don't hold up the card. And then I have the example where I said, now I think the first sound, uh, now I think, now I think, is the first sound in dog d, d, og. Yes, so I hold up my D card. Now you hold up your D card too. So this is really helpful to look at. I think. So that's doing what? That is verbalizing my thinking. Is the first sound in dog d, and I say d, og, to show further my thinking? And I say yes. So I hold up my D card. So I model holding up the card. Then I involve students. They're observing but I get them to hold up their card too. So they're participating. I'm using supporting practices there, but they're not doing any of the work. And I didn't continue the cycles, but I hope that you wrote them out, not just sort of did this because it's important for you to get practice thinking that through. So hopefully that was a good experience. We've now reached the end.
on part two. Well, let's wrap up. We have three activities to help you wrap up this module, part of the, this part of the module. Um, first, there are two online activities, a journal entry and discussion board, and sandwiched between them is a test of your modeling ability. Not a test, an opportunity to practice. So it's Thunderbolt time. Let's put all this into action. You're going to start with preparation. You're going to start with planning. In your journal, you're going to take an opportunity to write a lesson. You're going to start with a very clear objective. Lessons I often see that don't go as well as people want don't have as clear an objective as people think they, as peop, they don't have as clear an objective as they should, because people don't always think about how to be super clear on the objective. Then make sure you come up with a very clear explanation. Another pitfall of lessons is not adequately thinking through what the clear explanation should be like. And finally, make sure that the multiple models are each described. A third pitfall I see in many lessons is that only one model is used when students uh, need multiple models. Many skills are complex. Even things are relatively simple, like drawing a line to connect shapes, as you saw with Mr. Shu and Christian. You know that it's important for them to do multiple examples, even in something like that. So you want to build in multiple examples. So consider those things as you do this. When you're finished teaching your lesson, you're going to write a reflection. And what's great is you can compare your lesson to the checklist. We create these checklists for you as a way to make things more objective, to think about your instruction relative to a standard. And you can meet that standard just by doing the things that it says. And we hope that by watching these videos, by participating in lessons related to them, you are ready to do all of this. That you can compare your instruction to the checklist and that you have some strategies based on watching these modules. And then, obviously, you're going to try out the lesson in between these two steps. You're going to plan the lesson, and you're going to do the lesson. So after you've actually written it out, you're going to make sure to prepare before you actually do it. You want to try to make it about 10 minutes so that it's not a very long lesson. Work from the plan as you teach. I always hold in my hand my clear explanation of a lesson. So I don't teach uh, uh, children anymore, adolescents anymore. I work mostly with teachers like yourselves. However, when I do demonstration lessons in classrooms working with kids, I always have a written plan. And I always make sure to write down my explanation, and I jot down the examples of how I'm going to model it. I don't always write a full lesson plan. If I don't have that clear explanation, I know for myself my words will get all mixed up. You've seen me do that in these videos before. And so it's important for me to make sure I write that down. It's also valuable for you to think about how to teach these things quickly because you can do a lot in 10 minutes if you've carefully planned. And this is an opportunity for you to focus on carefully planning so that that works for students. The final thing for you to do in this part of the module is to write a journal entry about your experience. I'm uh, sorry, not to write a journal entry. You already did that. To post your journal entry and describe how the lesson went for other folks. And you want to read other people's lessons, uh, journal entries, and there uh, and discuss them relative to the checklist and see how they thought of their own instruction relative to the checklist and provide feedback about how they talked about their checklist relative to their instruction. Are they understanding what it means to do that part of the checklist? If so, great. Give them positive feedback about that. If you don't see a link to the checklist exactly, the great thing about the checklist is you can point to it and describe, here's what the checklist says. I'm not sure that what you just said is totally related to that exactly. Also, these videos are helpful because you can refer back to them and say, well, watch this part of the video. You can use the timestamps. Devin said this at timestamp X. And you can look back at that and say, that's where I'm thinking this might be different than what he meant by clear explanation or whatever else. And finally, you're going to respond to the evaluation others have shared to talk about your feelings about the module overall. This is a great opportunity for you to think about your instruction with others. We often find that working with other people to think about your lessons is a powerful, powerful way to uh, have lessons go well. And finally, I'll add, if you want bonus points, there are not any points necessarily, at least for me, you may have an instructor who asks you for points, but film it. Share it and add that to this discussion. It'll make it even richer. People can timestamp things and point things out to you at this moment and that moment. It will make it a beautiful, exciting conversation. So I strongly recommend that you do that. If you aren't able to do that, that's okay. 
but the videoing, the filming, is going to be really powerful for you. And with this, you've now uh, completed all of the tasks necessary to understand what it means to model effectively, how to come up with a clear explanation, and how to design planned examples for students to be successful. So I hope you're feeling ready to do this. I hope you're feeling ready to do that lesson, to reflect on it on your own, to reflect on it with a coach, to reflect on it with a peer, peers, and so on. And I think it's going to be a great opportunity for you to show everything you've learned. So good luck and have fun as you refine your skills by actually doing it in practice. So, Thunderbolt it and then talk about it.